Okay, thank you all for joining in. Uh, those of you that are watching uh, live streaming, we have now started. Give us a couple of seconds and we will start the meeting here, but thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to call the October 5th planning meeting of the Central York School Board to order. Please rise for the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Castle, will you take the roll? Yes. Please. Gemma? Here. Gothy? Here. Grothy? Here. Guth? Here. Johnson? Here. King? Here. Lewis? Here. Speed? Here. Wagner? Here. Um, that we approve the presented agenda as presented. So moved. Any discussion? Any votes to the contrary? Okay. Agenda passes. Moving on to administrative reports. We're going to start with Dr. Zarnecki from the high school. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the great things happening at the high school. As always, we're extremely proud of the accomplishments of our learners and thankful to our teachers for all that they are doing. Keystone testing started today for those learners who were registered in a Keystone course last spring. Per the directive from the state, we were required to provide testing to about 600 learners who were supposed to test last spring. Online software, Keystone review materials, and flex time were made available to learners to get assistance before testing. We wish all those learners well who are testing this week. Virtual parent guardian teacher conferences will be held October 7th from 12.30 to 7.30 and October 8th from 12.30 to 3.15. This is a change from last year where historically we held our conferences the days before Thanksgiving. We believe the change in conference schedule will be beneficial allowing parents guardians to receive more timely feedback earlier in the semester on the academic progress of their child. Mm -hmm. Parents and guardians were able to register for the 15 minute teacher conferences through Skyward. On the morning of Thursday, October 29th, all juniors will once again have the choice between taking the pre-SAT or PSAT exam or the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, better known as the ASVAB. Taking the PSAT provides several benefits to our 11th graders. The PSAT allows learners to find out what the SAT exam is like while predicting how they will do. It also allows learners to compete for scholarships awarded by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. A PSAT score provides learners an estimate of their chances of being accepted by the college of their choice, and it gives the option to have their names placed on a mailing list of colleges that are looking for learners of comparable scores. Though the ASVAB is historically used by the military for placement purposes, it also can provide career suggestions and guidance based upon their strengths on how well they scored. Another benefit for providing this opportunity to our juniors is that achieving an appropriate cut score on either the PSAT or ASVAB will meet one of the state's pathways to graduation for the class of 2022 and beyond. Learners should expect their scores in November or December. Along with their scores, College Board will send information about free online SAT tutoring program through Khan Academy, specifically tailored to a child's PSAT strengths and areas of growth. Homecoming week is upon us. We are disappointed that we're unable to host homecoming dance and homecoming parade due to the current guidelines. However, high school students are participating in Spirit Week activities and currently voting for homecoming king and queen. Uh, and now the athletic report from Mr. Trimmer. Fall sports are off to a good start as we are early in, in a condensed schedule season. 
Our football, field hockey, and girls soccer teams are undefeated. Boys and girls cross country have looked good to the start of the season and have scored many wins. Water polo has played a couple matches and are doing well. Girls tennis has played a good season with some exciting matches and will be starting county and district playoffs. Girls volleyball are currently two and one and in second in the division. Our golf team won division one championship for the seventh straight year and the county championship for the sixth straight year. They will compete in the district playoffs this week for a chance to go to the states. Overall, our student athletes have handled the, the, themselves well during trying times. They continue to be leaders on and off the competition fields. Lastly, February, October 2nd was National Custodial Appreciation Day. I'd like to thank Mr. Shields, Mr. Creasy, and our wonderful custodial staff for their hard work in ensuring our buildings and grounds are clean and well maintained. Pending any questions, that concludes my report. Mr. Speed. I just had a quick question about the water polo coach. I'd heard he'd been ill with the, did he had test positive for COVID? Or? Yeah, I don't have that information have right that now, information. sorry. So we're doing well with the coaching and staff to be able to? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. The assistant coach is filling in yeah. during the time, yes, sir. There you go. Um, two questions. One, the keystones that are being ministered now, is that measuring last year's academic levels where they should have been? Uh, the keystone exam is the end of course uh, exam. So for example, if a child was taking algebra, that spring, they would have to take the algebra then. Uh, if a learner was in English too, they would have to take the English, the literature at the end of that course, and then biology. So most kids either take the algebra in eighth grade or they take it ninth grade. Uh, English too typically is done at, the, at some time during their 10th grade year. And then biology, uh, most of our kids take the biology sometime their junior year. And that's when they take that assessment at the end of that semester. So will this assessment kind of give us some sense of where they completed last year versus where they are this year? I'm trying to get the sense of whether we're looking backward to see where they are relative to what where they should have been last year when it was scheduled. Yeah, certainly this is <laughs> not ideal as, as related to uh, the state mandating that, that we still have to provide that assessment. So, um, yeah, like I said, we provided those resources to those kids to get them prepared as best as possible. Um, but, um, yeah, it's uh, quite honestly a little... Um, uh, disadvantage that we have to still provide them that assessment, but that's the director from the state. And when will we get the results? We get the uh, results typically in the February time frame. Well, let me just say it's usually several months after the keystones are given. So, okay. um, and my my last question is, how is Mr. Kaufman doing? <laughs> how is Mr. Kaufman doing? Actually, he and I uh, continued to text. Uh, um, very regularly, he's doing well, busy. He's getting ready for the military, has their big um, um, event or, or, or drill that he's ultimately responsible for, but uh, he's doing well, thank you. He's in, in the country, so that's, that's what he's happy about. Mr. Zarnick, you have a question. So the students that took the courses that applied to the Keystones last spring, were there a ch was there a chance to review before the Keystones yep. now? Yep, so we gave them uh, access to an online platform where they were given all that, um, those opportunities there. They were also given all the Keystone departments, the algebra, the literature, and the biology provided a ton of resources that we emailed out to the kids um, that they could go on. It's on our website as we speak to go in and practice, like for example, um, uh, the practice packets or, or the state has released uh, old tests uh, in the past, that's up there. 
Um, in addition to, we allowed kids to get extra help during uh, flex time if they wanted it. So, Miss Gemma, um, the duration of time that has transpired from the actual teaching of the course and then taking the assessments, I think that's what Dr. Zarnecki and I are concerned about is that duration of time that lapse. Parents had a chance to opt out. Most, though, chose to uh, move forward with it. But I, to your point, I think our scores will not be truly reflective of if they took the assessment at the end of the course, which is a pretty good idea of what they can, they can't do. They had a full spring, right? So I'd be curious to see what those scores are in February. Because mm -hmm. my daughter wanted to opt out of biology. I wouldn't let her. So <laughs> we'll see how she does. <laughs> Are other schools taking these tests under the same conditions as us, i.e. taking them the tests this fall, having had incomplete semesters in the spring as well, correct? Correct, yeah. So all schools and all students are operating under the same conditions for this testing? Correct. So uh, assessing the performance across districts would not, we would not be at any special or unique disadvantage, correct? Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Dr. Zanecki. Yep, thank you. Dr. Harper, welcome. Good evening. Um, like the high school, the middle school will have virtual parent-teacher conferences this Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, as well at the middle school. Um, all middle school families have the opportunity to conference with their child's teachers, both team teachers and specials teachers via June or via Zoom. And for um, this is also a change, just like the high school. Normally, our conferences have been held in November, um, but we look forward to being able to speak with parents earlier this school year. And for the first time at the middle school, we will also be able to offer parent-teacher conferences in the spring. So that is not something we have ever had before and are very happy to be able to have that time this year. Um, I wanted to take a moment to address um, some concerns with remote learners at middle school. Um, we saw an increase in learners who were not attending their Zoom classes and or were failing one or more remote classes. So last week, letters were sent to remote families, um, those families who have learners who were either not consistently attending classes and or were failing one or more remote classes. As a result of the letters that were mailed last week, they were sent via Skyward and traditional mail. We have had multiple families um, who have decided to return their learners back to the brick and mortar building. Last month, I spoke with you about our efforts to identify learners who need math and reading interventions, and I am happy to report that reading and math interventions at the middle school have begun and opportunities for remote learners to receive additional interventions and academic support have also been created and started. To celebrate homecoming, just like at the high school, the middle school student council organized a spirit week for both traditional and remote learners. Today was crazy hair or hat day and tomorrow is color wars. So each team has a different color. Um, some clubs have been able to start at the middle school. Clubs like Avidum and Student Council have been able to hold meetings in the building remotely. So during our flex time, rather than the students all gathering in one room, our um, advisors for those clubs have been running meetings on Zoom so the kids can just sit in their flex, put their headphones on, and join in the meeting. So it's been really great to have a little bit of normalcy with our clubs for our kids at the end of the day. And uh, Mr. Gothi, I did not forget your request for data. Um, we have been sorting through data to organize and start our intervention groups. And now we're going through that process of cross-referencing our current data with what we had available to us from last school year. And so I will have more information to report to you at the November meeting. So pending any questions, that concludes my report. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, sometimes it has to, you have to push it a couple of times. Yeah. That darn button. <laughs> so the interventions, when are you doing that during the class day? Sure, so for our students who are brick and mortar, those interventions have always been scheduled in their actual schedule throughout the day. So that has remained consistent. Um, for our learners who are virtual, we have added in some extra support times for them at the end of the school day during flex so that they're avail uh, both math and reading teachers are available during that time. And do you, did that start already? Yes. For virtual? Do you know about how many are participating virtual? Um, I would have to ask the teachers. I know that they have had some, but I'm just not sure of the numbers. And did I hear you correctly that the kids that are virtual that are not either showing up or mm -hmm. failing something that their parents have sent them now to brick and mortar? Um, so some have chosen to return. Um, we saw an increase. We at the middle school have been able to contact all families. We don't have any that are unaccounted for, but we had a few students who were not attending regularly. Um, and so with the remote attendance, that could mean either they're not showing up for class um, on Zoom or they're not submitting assignments. So we found all those seventh and eighth graders who either weren't attending consistently or were failing one or more classes. And I sent a letter to those families and some of those families have opted to return their students to school. Thank you. Sure. Did you get uh, responses to all of the letters that you sent out? Or it, No, we did not get responses to all of them. Um, I do not have a number, but we have heard from many families since that time. And some kids are getting back on track and others, the families have realized this might not have been a good option and their kids are coming back. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are most or all of the kids with special needs, the IEPs, coming to brick and mortar? Um, that really was dependent upon uh, their family choice. Um, I don't, I want to speak out of turn. Mrs. Lud or Dr. Ludwig could probably help us. Most of our learners who have the most, um, you know, severe disabilities have opted to come back to school, but we do have students with some disabilities who are not as severe, who are doing the remote learning Likewise, there are a few um, with the more severe disabilities who for various reasons are at home. So it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. Dr. Harper, question for you, kind of piggybacking off of sure. uh, Ms. Grothy. If a learner was having difficulties logging on, would, that, would they be in risk of being captured as not present or essentially skipping yeah. the so, class? Um, most of them should not have been uh, because we were able to work with our families whose students have, if they have had difficulties logging into Zoom, but they have still completed all of the work, then they would be counted as being, as, as having attended class for the day because they have submitted all of their work. Okay. Thank you. Yep. For the, for the parents you haven't heard from. What's the next step? So our next step, we have parent-teacher conferences. So a lot of the families have signed up. So if they don't sign up for parent-teacher conferences or we just haven't heard back, we don't see an improvement, the next step will be phone calls from us. And then ultimately, if at the building level we don't hear back, we would address things with Mr. Grove as well. Um, but again, these are all families that we have heard from. These aren't families that we haven't had contact with at all. It's just that their learners might not be holding up their end of the bargain. So we have nobody that's just missing. And we've Correct. Not, we've not, well, that's good Correct. Thank you. Yeah, On the same line, Dr. Zarnecki, do we have a number of students at the high school level who are not showing up either remotely or in brick and mortar classes? Like the middle school, zero or unaccounted for. Uh, like middle school, we have some learners that, that uh, we're concerned about for not submitting work in a timely fashion. And like the middle school, we continue to go through our interventions uh, to, outreach, to have outreach to those families and to, you know, help those kids begin to actively engage. 
Do we have any numbers of how many kids are behind in terms of in, in either either level? How many kids are just not performing? <laughs> I want to share this. Sheet. Sorry, I'm, I'm short. <laughs> Social distancing. <laughs> um, right now, we just uh, entered basically being in October 1. We have the interim progress reports, and the counselors and administrators are going through those lists right now. And it, it varies uh, per grade level. Um, so to give you an exact number, I don't have that. But uh, uh, again, this is part of the normal process that we would follow through the, any school year, brick and mortar and or remote. Ms. Guth, I can add on to that. Um, I meet with David, I meet with Kelly, and I get to sit with their team. And what they do is they take me through a listing of kids. So at the high school level, the uh, assistant principal comes in and they talk about the kids that they are responsible for. And we talk about the number of courses that are not being passed. And we know exactly who the child is and how many courses they did not pass. It could be one, could be two, could be three. And we have that on a master list. So we can bring that up at uh, mid uh, four times a year at the high school. The same thing would happen with the middle school. Uh, we would have the assistant principals come in and we'd go through our seventh and eighth grade learners. They'd be able to tell me not only who they are, they would go into uh, some of the specifics and down into the interventions, no different than the high school. So the high school, we think about graduation. Uh, one of the things we're most proud of is when we bring you a graduation number, that's um, a high graduation rate. And uh, if you go back to this time of the school year, right to your question, there are usually traditionally a number of students who we have grave concerns about not graduating on time. So there's a cohort graduation rate that we hold near and dear. And it's important because we're evaluated uh, through PDE. So we can bring those numbers back to you. That's not a problem, and we can give you uh, how they're progressing at the middle school and high school quarterly. At the elementary, we can do that in trimesters. It just, I mean, is the consensus for the two of you basically that this is a, a variation on a theme that we would have in a normal year, which is kids getting behind, maybe they're, I call it presenteeism, where they're present, but they're not really doing what they need to do. I mean, there's a, a new, you know, it's, it's in a new bottle, which is this online learning, but is it really a substantially bigger problem than it is in any given year with the same sort of scenario? No, you're, you're correct. Okay. What you said is correct. That's comforting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have um, Mr. Yuchef uh, with the elementary report. <laughs> Good evening. Well, the elementary team would like to uh, start this evening by thanking all of our learners at, at K-6 to for all of their hard work, both brick and mortar and remote, as well as our teachers and support staff for all of their work uh, thus far this year. So everyone's working really hard at the elementary level. Uh, this evening, we'll start with talking about uh, this Friday's staff development session. Um, our K-3 teachers will be receiving on Friday professional development on the new Acadience assessment tools. Acadience will be used to assist in determining a learner's encoding, decoding, comprehension, and some basic math um, components to assess, assess mathematical skills. Acadience is a free tool, and Mrs. Grodden has been trained and will deliver the staff development for our K-3 teachers during this time. At the four to six level, our teachers will be taking part in staff development that's provided by our Lakeside coach. And if you remember, our, our Lakeside is the trauma-informed care group that we worked with last year. And we'll be working uh, with some materials that support the social emotional needs of our learners. The, the title we'll be working with is social and emotional well-being for our students. Uh, we will then engage our teachers with an article um, entitled Maintaining Relationships. And that will focus on those relationships, both brick and mortar as well as remote. Our fall assessments at the elementary level are also well underway at this time. Uh, the assessments uh, assist our teachers in understanding where all of our learners are in their learning progression. Um, this year, more than ever, it will assist us in addressing any gaps and deficits um, that we're noticing with any of our children. The primary team will engage with the Cadence, as I mentioned earlier, as that'll be rolled out here um, over the next week. Um, and that Acadience, the reading and math, really will help the teachers to identify the children at risk, uh, both reading and math, and determine the skills to target for instructional support. These screenings are done three times a year and uh, help 
will be provided through a universal screening tool. Uh, that universal screening tool is gauged K to six. So we'll be assessing that at the uh, four, six level as primary rolls through this a little bit as well. The intermediate team has already utilized um, some assessments to start the year. We've already given the reading assessment, or excuse me, the reading inventory, uh, formerly known as the scholastic reading inventory, you're familiar with the SRI. It's now just entitled the RI, which provides a Lexile level uh, for our children's reading ability, focuses on the comprehension component. Um, and we've also given this year the scholastic reading assessment, which again is a comprehension-based assessment that we've given to all of our learners at the intermediate level, which is assesses both a fiction and nonfiction text. We're also using and implementing the IXL diagnostic tool to evaluate our mathematics progression for our learners at four to six. Um, both of our intermediate buildings, as well as Stony Brook, have begun the process of interacting with an MTSS coach. MTSS stands for Multi-Tiered System of Support. Um, so when you're looking at an MTS system, you're talking about tier one, which is your basic overall instructional um, level curriculum, um, tier two, which is intervention level, and tier three is a more intensive intervention level. Dr. Blouse from IU12 is working with our teams from Stony Brook, North Hills, and Sinking Springs. We'll be meeting with her regularly over the next few months to discuss exemplary mathematics instructional practices to help and assist in our tier one instruction as well as working with her to discuss some potential universal screening tools for all learners and research-based mathematics interventions to, to apply to any, struggling, any of our struggling learners. In the coming week, our elementary librarians will begin the process of implementing a new manner for disseminating library books to our learners at the elementary level. Um, obviously, um, some of the protocols we put in place have, um, has not allowed us to do that to this point. Um, our librarians believe that we've come up with a safe process uh, to begin um, sharing books with our learners. And we're excited to begin that at the intermediate level with our grade six children in the next week. Uh, with success, uh, we'll work that process down the grade levels uh, all the way down to our primary learners. And we're very excited to be able to get those library books back in the hands of our children here in the very near future. And finally, uh, virtual intramurals um, are coming to our intermediate learners. Uh, both North Hills and Sinking Springs are currently offering some remote uh, virtual intramurals to our learners. These sessions will run after school from 4.15 to 5 o'clock via Zoom. Um, learners who select that intramural will be able to engage um, from home um, in a safe and socially distant manner while still building relationships with peers and adults and taking part in learnings and activities that are, that are of interest to them outside of the traditional school curriculum. And I know some of the offerings right now are coding. Um, I believe there's a yoga offering and there is a choir offering uh, that children will be able to participate in from home at this time. At that time, that concludes our elementary board report. Penny, any questions? Again, this is for all levels. Are you seeing a higher level of social emotional problems or concerns this year as compared to previous years? I wouldn't say a higher level. I think it looks a little different this year as the children came back. Um, you know, with a lot of the procedures and protocols we had in place, they weren't really sure what to make of that. Um, so it took them a while to kind of acclimate uh, to the classroom environments, both the structures of our classrooms, um, the manners in which we move out the building, move in and out of the building. Um, I think what we're starting to see now um, is we're starting to see our children open up a little bit more, which is good. Um, but they also know that it's not typical. Um, so we're starting to hear that from them a little bit. They recognize that this isn't what uh, schools look like for them in the past. So we are seeing a little bit of that from the children at this point. But a high level of social emotional needs, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a higher level. It just looks a little bit different. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. I have three items to share with the board. The first is Health Hero. Since 2015, Central York School District has worked with Health Hero PA to provide influenza vaccination clinics for all volunteering district learners. The building level clinics are scheduled for tomorrow, Tuesday, October 6, 2020. The clinics have uh, no out-of-pocket costs and immunize every healthy child that returns a completed consent form signed by their parent or guardian. The clinics are overseen by a licensed doctor and vaccinations are provided by licensed professionals who have previously submitted required PA clearances to the attention of our Miss Bobby Billman. 
I'd like to compliment our school nurses, building principals, and Ms. Dick for leading this yearly offering, as well as those parents that have elected to participate in this process. In 2019, compliments to the school board, we had 731 K-12 learners participate, and then tomorrow, expecting 630 uh, K-12 with 30 remote K-12 learners participating. Any remote learner will be able to come to Sinking Springs and receive their vaccinations. So that concludes the Health Hero offering. Next is a common theme that you heard tonight about school attendance. Uh, and at your desktop is a letter that was sent out from my office uh, helping our building level principals. So in an attempt to ensure that all learners, brick and mortar and remote, are attending school on a regular basis, we've done the following. Uh, building level phone calls, building level letters, district letters, as uh, mentioned and uh, in front of you, uh, and enlisted the services of our social workers. So uh, I think it was, um, you had mentioned about what else can we do? Home visits. Uh, they will go out and they will go in a tandem so they're safe, but they'll visit the home. We've been known to go out and conduct those home visits as well. It's not to do anything other than engage in a relationship. So those parents that did answer the door, it was an opportunity to find out their condition, so to speak, and just ask, what can we do to make sure said child's back in either remote um, and that means uh, attendance wise for logging on and submitting work on a daily basis by the state law. That's that's what uh, that's what attendance constitutes. And then uh, building level student assist attendance improvement conferences and development of school attendance improvement plans. So um, the K through 12, we worked with stock and leader to make sure we are consistent when it comes to the student attendance plans and then the process for developing those school attendance improvement plans with parents. Just a note that a parent and a child does not have to participate in those plans. So uh, we encourage to have that dialogue and get them involved. But if we have a student who is um, not attending school on a regular basis, if we have to, we'll move forward and make sure there's a plan developed and we help that child get to school on a, on a routine basis. And then finally, the October educational focus, the school board and community members will be providing additional targeted support and improvement quarterly update addressing the high school special education learners, progress in the identified areas of state assessments, academic growth, graduation rate, attendance, and career standards benchmarks. So on the 19th, um, we will have a presentation from um, the high school as well as our, our special education department and we will bring you up to speed on what was previously presented before when it comes to ATSI. At that point, uh, I concluded tonight's remarks and be happy to respond to any board uh, questions. Any questions for Mr. Grove? Thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Snell. Thank you, I have five items. Number one is the Act One Index. Last week, September 30th, the Pennsylvania Department of Education um, released the Act 1 index. I'll turn it over to Mr. Kessler for a brief walkthrough, sir. Thank you. Uh, so this year for building the budget for the 21-22 school year, the base index for the state is 3.0%. And then every district has an adjusted index based on aid ratio and some other factors. Our adjusted index is 3.8%. Um, so that is what, uh, when we look to either at any point in time, December preliminary budget will share a bunch more information, the charts that show what that means both for revenue generated, but the average taxpayer, um, and what it means is a tax increase. Uh, and then come, uh, June when we adopt a final budget. And so that's really, we wanted to share PD just released it. 3% is the base index and then 3.8 is our specific Central York Index. Next item I have is a COVID sort of update. Uh, there is a chart, Mr. Kessler, if you will click on that, the uh, learning options enrollment. Um, I think the principals mentioned some of this, but we are still hovering at about 68% of our learners who are in person, 28% um, who are remote. And then I think the uh, Central York Cyber Academy, Edge and other have always resided around the two, the one and the 1%. So if you go across the in-person to remote along the bottom line, you'll see that there are a number of folks um, coming and going. Uh, ultimately, lately, we've seen more remote learners coming back in. 
Um, of concern always is how often and how fluid are we? And we're terribly fluid, although that causes some concern. So we're having some internal conversations about how often and when, but we are pleased with the fact that we still remain open. We have one um, identified case in the entire district um, within the last 14 days. Um, and so that trend, hopefully knocking on some wood will continue. I think things are going very well, um, but those are the most recent numbers um, that uh, we have to share with you. Again, only one case in the district. Uh, I would say, and I'll look at Ms. Billman just to sort of nod on any given day, as well as the principals, we might send two to five students home, a little bit higher than that. Okay, three to six, four to eight. Um, thankfully, um, by the end of the week, a good number of them come back as a negative, um, but that is a trend on a given day when we see reports. Compliments to our principals, especially our nurses, who man the front lines in all of this. We get a report a sheet on uh, the student, uh, the symptoms and all of that. We get a list of the class rosters and things so that if we did need to execute contract tracing, all of that is, is delivered to us up front. So it's a very well-fined protocol, compliments to our principals uh, and certainly our nurses who help manage that. Um, but that's sort of the update that we have at this point. Things are uh, moving along fine. Town meeting, October 21st, 7 p.m. At this point, giving restrictions, et cetera, it will be Zoom, but stay tuned. October 21st, 7 p.m., just the broad announcement, and we'll see how that plays out going <coughs> forward. Um, you may have seen this in the PSBA Daily Update. We were awarded Central York School District Keystone Series 2 Scholarship. Um, we are the recipient um, of $1,250 that the district school board can award to a student of their choice. We are waiting for additional information as well as they said they will furnish the check. Um, I will engage with the board as to what that might sound like, look like, and how you would like to um, award that scholarship. But we were one of the last school districts in this series of scholarships um, to be offered that. So that is good news. Last thing we have for you is a follow-up. There was a newspaper article and I believe I had a couple of questions. So here are cyber um, charter costs. Um, and where we stand at the beginning of this year. And so on the left hand of the side, I'll really turn it over to Mr. Kessler to walk through the numbers. On the left hand side, you will see what those costs were in 2019-20, and you will see what those costs are at this given moment here in 2021. This document, as well as the previous document, are listed in board docs for anybody to access. And uh, Mr. Kessel, will you walk us through the chart, please? Yes, sir. So again, just to pull where we were from 2019-20, this was as of March 13th, which basically everything was frozen enrollment, that type of situation. So these were the March numbers where we ended our own Central York Cyber Academy, had 59 students. Again, the rate for a cost. And then cyber charter, so everything else outside, every cyber charter, you can see where the students were listed. These are the two separate rates. It's $10,800 for regular ed and $21,700 roughly for a special education student at any of the cyber charter schools. Um, so those numbers up here, we had 155 total uh, and it generated two, well, it generated 1.8 million, almost 1.9 million um, of cyber charter cost added to the 247,000 that was our own cyber academy for a total of 2.1 million of what we're calling online costs. Rolling over to the right hand side, and these numbers are all from the first report that Dr. Snell just reviewed. Again, both attachments are in board docs for the public. Um, this is our current as of last Friday uh, enrollment. So, so our, our own Cyber Academy has 98 students at that rate, same rate. Uh, Edge, so the Lincoln Edge, where we have about 30 learners presently, we have 24 that are regular ed, about six that are special ed. They have a slightly higher cost. And then this year's numbers on the, on the right hand side have increased about 31 students. So we're up to 186 compared to the 155 that are outside Central York. Um, and the rates this year are 11,300 regular ed, 22,300 special education. And so a grand total of 2.3 for a total total of online learning of 2.9. And so you can see the increase um, both in numbers based on enrollment and then based on cost, um, what it will mean to our budget. So we will update this every Friday, just like Dr. Snell does the uh, other charts for enrollment and keep track of it. That's all we have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
I have a question about this chart. Um, how does how does this compare to what we budgeted for this year? Very good question. Um, so we are going to be over budget. Um, we only budgeted 1.9 million for our cyber charter, so we were just at um, what we were at last year because that's been our. We've been averaging 150 students um, the last several years prior to this. So when we did our budget even in March and April. Um, had no idea what the projections would be. Um, so we are about 300 to 400,000. If these hold, if they stay all year long, if this 186, um, sometimes they come and go or come back or change. Um, but at this point we would be about three to 400,000, um, over budget for cyber charter that is charter. And then obviously we didn't budget anything for the edge, um, and so that's about another 200,000. So anywhere from five to 600,000 potentially we would be over budget. Uh, Jody, Jody Grothy the, to the person that wanted us to speak her name first. Um, I don't know if this would be for Dr. Snell or for, or for Brent, but when we were meeting during the retreat and we were talking about the cyber cost and I think it came out to the high school kids that are paying like we're that are charged like 200 and some dollars per credit do you, do you guys know what I'm talking about like Kara took some classes online Sweet. that were not nest she's she's in the building say that now again. Odyssey? It's Odyssey the Century Wear. York Academy. So Odyssey yeah, Wear. Which would be the Century York Cyber here. That's our Odyssey Wear, which is Century York Cyber. Okay. So 4200 is the rate. And so For that, that went from 247.8 to 411.6. Is that correct? Okay. So out of the 98 students for 2021, are any of these students in the building, brick and mortar kids? that are just taking classes that we're paying for. I, I don't know if Mr. Billet, if we want to join this, I hate to put you on the spot, but I think it's two different things. I think the, the 4,200 is the annual cost for the full cyber Academy. Okay. I think she's referring to just a course, one a course, course yes. which is still the smaller rate. And I guess I would ask Mr. Billet to, help us push it a couple of times. Oh, sorry. Just keep pushing it. There you go. All right. Thank you. Um, so yes, individual courses are $240 through the Odyssey Wear Academy, which includes the teacher of record from Odyssey Wear. That $4,200 cost is in fact, if that student stays in cyber, takes a full course load for the entire year. Um, so we also have site licenses um, that we pay for that are $100 per license. Um, that we have in the district as well. Um, we contract that through the LIU because we get uh, consortium pricing on that. It's much cheaper than what it would be if we went out to secure that through Odyssey Word directly. So my question again, the $240 cost, is that correct? So again, the, the students that are in the school that are sitting up in the library doing Odyssey Wear classes versus being in front of a teacher, are we paying for them? And are they part of this, this number? Yes, we are. Okay, so can you guys find out how many of those students are in the library doing Odyssey Wear class where, when they possibly could? I'm not talking about the athlete that is the gymnast or the swimmer. I'm talking about the kid that goes to school every day and sits in the library and takes an Odyssey Wear class versus going and sitting in a classroom in front of a teacher. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll follow up. I remember your question now. Absolutely, we'll follow up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ryan. I know that was just me. I, I did mention the fluidity between the brick and mortar, and you're really talking about the brick and mortar and remote, not the cyber, right, because they're remote. So uh, what, what issues are, are we facing if someone – for instance, they call in sick that day, but they do remote. Uh, are we counting them? If they come online, they're able to come online. Are we counting them absent or are we counting them sick? I mean, yeah, that, that's yeah, a, we're asking parents to still submit an absence. It's 
Yeah, that's right. Could you, yeah, could you, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to make you walk, Dave. Yeah, that's all right. At least I'm not kneeling this time. <laughs> that's it. Now, we've asked um, parents and students still, or parents still, submit an excused absence. So we all know that the parent understands your child's sick. But we, we want to encourage if you're, you're still well enough to hop on the Zoom so you don't get too far behind, please do that. But, but, but again, we ask that um, parents do submit that as an absent that their child is sick. So everyone knows that, you know, we just don't want a, a child to say, oh, I'm not feeling it t t today. I have a bad hair game today. I'm not going to come in. No, we want the parent to still go ahead and submit it. So... And even when you're sick, you're still a brick and mortar student. You could be sick for several days. You can keep up and, and with, with Schoology, but you're, we don't transfer you out quickly to remote. We, don't, we want parents to come back, obviously, and we think we see that trend coming, but it's not that fluid, I think, if that's your question. Yeah, we don't change that. It doesn't reflect on those numbers up there. We don't call them remote for that period of time. So. You'd mentioned in your initial discussion that you were working issues. I was just trying to figure out what the issue was for that. It's um, the, the issue becomes when when and it's a good issue now when kids are coming back because we think that's just a, a good sign. But when when I think over the last couple of weeks and we could go back and look at that, we had some coming and some going the very first time. Uh, what was it, Labor Day, when we announced our first couple of cases. We had some people then run back, and now those people maybe two, three weeks later come back. So there's this sense of it would make sense, better sense, I suppose, to put some limit on it, although I think, you know, the, the increase of only 30 students going to a cyber school is somewhat indicative of our approach to be as fluid as possible. It becomes a management problem when they're coming and going and making that choice every week or two weeks, whereas we'd like to say, look, stick, stay where you're at, that's the fluidity issue that, if that helps, if that sort of. Um, and the other question was, um, you'd mentioned that you have six to eight uh, people being sent home. Is that symptom-based, where they their fever or their cough or something? Absolutely. And, and, you know, whether you take a look at the COVID symptoms, bronchitis, you know, allergies, those kinds of things. And so, yes, they're symptom-based, and um, there's a protocol that they go through with delineating what those symptoms are. And thankfully, they come back you know, testing negative. Before you leave, one, one more question. When someone is sick and they're staying home and they want to Zoom, is that something that has to be conveyed to the teacher so they let them in on the Zoom? Um, most, if not all, teachers have that Zoom link already on their Schoology page. So that would be simply uh, the child going into Schoology, finding that Zoom link, and then signing on. The, the checks and balances is that, okay, said learner uh, li uh, signs on, the, the, the teacher just wants to make sure that, that, that that's okay, and the parent has gone in and make sure they put it as an excused absence. So our goal is to make sure that uh, the parents, at the end of the day, know the child is home legitimately because of an illness and they just, the child, you know, the parent may go to work or whatever and not know that the child may choose just to stay home. We're trying to prevent that as much as possible. But the student is not prohibited from entering the remote. No. The reason I bring this up is my daughter was part of the, you know, she was in the contact tracing. Mm -hmm. And one of the teachers didn't get the note and said, well, you're not on my remote list and therefore yeah, you so can't come. So I didn't know yeah. how we communicated with the teacher so they would allow the student to participate. Right. The, the cadence that I follow and it's it, if it doesn't happen on the weekend, they're usually a shorter time frame here. But if it happens over the weekend. So I work closely with Miss Billman and the teachers and then or excuse me to say who is in that uh, uh, group. And then what I do is contact the parents and guardians. And then after that, I contact the counselors of those ch children. And I say, please reach out to your uh, ki children on your caseload there that this is impact and notify the teachers that this child will be working from home for X amount of days. And I do apologize uh, if that there's a slight delay from the time I get to the counselor and the counselor gets to the uh, the teacher, but, you know, we want to try to do that as quickly as possible, obviously, so they don't impact it instructionally. 
So. Okay, at this point, we are ready for our first um, segment of citizen comments. And uh, the rules of, for public comment are obviously the Board of School Directors encourages comments from the community members during citizen comments section of the agenda. Um, the board requests that neither complaints concerning job performance nor allegations of misconduct related to specific employees or students be raised at the public meeting. To the extent citizens have concerns about such matters, they should be referred to the superintendent. Looking closely at our um, citizen common policy, there is a section that says that um, I may uh, interrupt or terminate a participant's statement when the statement is too lengthy, personally di directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. So I think we've been moving along pretty well. We've been working with our five minute timer. I'm not sure how many you have tonight, uh, Mr. Kessler, but we will get you started. So if somebody is sending a comment to be read as part of our citizen comments, um, if there is a problem, they will, with any of these policies, they will not be read. Yes. Mr. I'm Lewis. Probably going to take flack for this, but everybody on this board can read. And in 10 years, there's never been, at least that I've seen a case of, the administration withholding anything from us. They send the good, the bad, the ugly. The last email that I see on my computer came in at 437 from Rebecca Allison. Why can't we not waste, stop wasting Brent's time and just say these were admitted to the record and just stick them on the website? Uh, I've read them all. I have no doubt that everybody here has read them all. What purpose does it serve to sit here and spend them? sometimes at 11 o'clock at night going through these things. That's it, crazy. Um, we can have a discussion about that, I guess. Uh, right now, most of the emails, like you said, are being sent to everyone, and we're all seeing them ahead of time. Um, I think Brent could say they're admitted to the record. The issue is obviously the social studies things, we have six letters for and five against or whatever the number is. And there was one letter about fans in the stand and anything that's coming after 453, maybe we could read that, but I don't think we have all that many, but it, it is a waste of everybody's time to sit here and have him reading. Um, I happen to disagree. I think that um, it's important the public hear the comments from the public and the purpose of citizen comment is so the public can hear what the citizens are having to say. I don't believe, I believe the purpose of the citizen comments is, that, and they're always done for a, a vote. Uh, they used to always have to be on an agenda item. We, we did change the policy last year or the year before that we allowed uh, people to address um, things that were not on the agenda. But the idea is that the citizen comments are directed to the board in a public board meeting. And that that's our opportunity to um, hear what they have to say in case there's something someone in the community might want to share with us that might um, be a part of our vote. So where we're at in the agenda right now is citizen comment, not debating policy changes. And we have a policy committee for that. Uh, maybe that's an appropriate topic. But um, I, I think we're going to be here till 11 if we keep talking about it. Let's hear the comments, and that's the way we've always done it. Let's do it. That's fine. Mr. Kessler? Yes, I have about 20 um, comments tonight. First of all, and these started the, about a week, week and a half ago, September 24th through today. The first one is from Emily Cotton. Hello, I have three children in the district. We should not be spending any time reading or hearing comments from people that do not reside in Central York School District. It is absurd that the board and Central York citizens are taking comments and opinions from people not affected by the board's discussions and actions. We must require that only those within the district are allowed to have their say in this forum. Emily Cotton. Shelley Lawyer, to whom it may concern. Good morning, I am writing to you as a concerned citizen. I do not have a student at your district. However, if I did, they would not be a student there long. 
how is it okay for teachers having the book, Not My Idea, on their reading list for their students? A lot of citizens, including myself, would call this unjustly radical and most of all propaganda. The duty of an educator is to teach our children math, science, English, and history, not to indoctrinate innocent minds. The question is, what are you as school leaders going to do about this? I anxiously await a response. Thank you for your time and consideration of my email and concern. Shelley Lawyer. Um, this one uh, could be long, Miss Johnson, page and a half. Uh, Tim Strickler, Dear Central York School Board, on the subject of the Diversity Committee summer meeting resource list discussed at recent board meetings through and including 921, I trust public comments have been duly noted by the board administration and we can move on. In reflection, I wonder if these discussions might be instructive for improved exchange on future sensitive dialogue. First is an observation that transparency from the school administration is necessary, especially upon specific request and lack of it made this latest dialogue more stressing on everyone. Second is an observation that we, members of the public and board, were not discussing the same thing, resulting in overgeneralized and polarizing debate, which was never brought back on point by the board. Quite simply, public comments of concern on this topic centered on transparency of the CYSD administration on the diversity committee summer meeting resource list, appropriateness of those resources and how those resources were being used in social studies curriculum pilot or teacher diversity training. The comments were not a rebuke of diversity, inclusion, the diversity committee, teachers or teaching resources at large. Cited as just one specific example was the picture books for teachers, counselors, resource link called Black Lives Matter Instructional Library. And within that, a book example entitled Not My Idea, a book about whiteness, which appears to be precisely the opposite of diversity, acceptance and inclusion. Instead of, instead of addressing the specific concern, opposing comments from the public and even some board members countered with generalized posturing. In fact, as far as I know, not a single defense was made of the specific library noted above nor cognate argument offered of why the specific book noted above was not racist material determined to our detrimental to our children, thus raising the question of what, whether those voicing opposition even reviewed the resource. To this day, we don't have the CYSD administration position on the specific library content, which after all that time and energy leaves the public with the same foggy concern. In good faith, I believe the fog wasn't intentional, but I respectfully request that the school administration promptly go on record as to whether they support the specific example Black Lives Matter instructional library material found from the link within their diversity committee summer meeting resource list. And if they do, then explain why and publish the specific titles and links from within this library for public to see clearly. As a reminder to some members of the Science Council, culture spilling into our schools and the effect that it had on resources used to teach our children and the damage inflicted upon our ability for rational discussion. Vital is our ability for civil and substantive debate, staying on point and raising questions where duty requires whether that be remote learning, sports attendance, concerning teacher resources or otherwise. My hope is that we can all do better next time around and let our children witness focused discourse with coexisting acceptance of both diversity and race and diversity and thought. These are pressured times, exhausting even, being a school board member is tough and running a school system even tougher. Thank you for your service and I am behind you. I simply request honest transparency from CYSD and due respect for exercise of reasonable questioning and opinions by all taxpayers, parents, without being polit pol politicized and bullied into silence. Tim Strickler. Linda Tate, come on board. Let us see our children and grandchildren live at least two home football games. Paid my taxes to you for 25 years without a child in the system. Let me see my only granddaughter, a senior, leading the band just one time. Linda Tate. Dear Central York School Board members, I graduated from Central. Oh, this is from Kara Koloski. Kol I graduated from Central. My mom, three older brothers, younger sister, aunts, uncles, cousins, cousins, kids graduated or will graduate from Central. Now I have a niece at Central and her sisters will join her in the coming years. I'm also a Central York School District taxpayer. It's very worrisome to hear the board members who spoke up and asked questions recently were berated and depicted as racist for raising concerns about the subject and groups the new curriculum represents. We should all be asking questions about everything that's going on around us right now. I do not believe that 
It is the public school system's role to teach any political views or agendas, certainly not to elementary age children, furthermore, without parental consent. I believe it's the parent's job to approach these issues when they deem it appropriate for their child or children, not what and when the public school system sees fit. The public school system is supposed to teach math, science, language arts, the facts about history, not any specific political thought, and music, art, phys ed, etc. Beyond being taught the main subjects, the principles of honesty, personal accountability, dedication, perseverance, discipline, resiliency, and hard work should be encouraged. At family parties, I can almost guarantee that at some point I'll hear my uncle, who is a lifelong farmer and businessman, refer to the quote etched into the stone at the front of the old Century York High School steps. Much good work is lost for the lack of a little more. It's time to get back to the basics. I don't care who you are, what color, or how much money you have. There is only one guarantee in life, and life is hard. Some of the most important traits to get us through the difficult times are perseverance, resiliency, and hard work. Diversity isn't an either or idea. The concept of diversity does not teach that gays are good and straights are bad, Jews are good and Christians are bad, people with disabilities are good and healthy people are bad. Diversity is supposed to teach that we need to accept everyone's differences and we can all coexist together regardless of those differences. It celebrates uniqueness, uniqueness so why is the curriculum encouraging that we only see color and should accept blacks for being black but whites are bad? The teacher's resource focus on white fragility and white supremacy. The little kids in my family, the little kids in my family don't know anything about skin color and the big kids have friends of all races. We focus on the quality of the person, not color of one skin. But this curriculum would have them only see color and suggest that they should not suggest that they should feel bad for people of color and feel guilty for being white. What does talking about white privilege teach other than to possibly make white kids feel poorly about themselves? Didn't we just spend two plus decades trying to boost kids' self-esteem and create an environment where everyone is worth and wins? After looking at the teacher resources, culturally responsive leadership, it seems this curriculum is only teaching division, not diversity. It focuses on sympathy for blacks stuck in a victim mentality and anger and resentment toward whites who are very likely not even the problem. Central needs to focus on fact-based academics, extracurricular activities, and a diversity program that teaches love and acceptance for all people without any labels. Central should be reinforcing the idea of respect for family, teachers, friends, and property, and emphasize the importance of perseverance and hard work. Thank you, Kara. Shelva Eller, the pilot curriculum for social studies, literature, guidance, and library may meet PA state standards but it does not meet the standards approved by the federal government. This curriculum contains material that is anti-American, similar to the 1619 project rejected by President Trump. American history is revised to remove our Judeo-Christian heritage. It is critical of capitalism and promotes socialism. It removes family values and supports critical race theory. How do I know? It is curriculum written for ISTE by the United Nations. The academics are written from a global worldview, removing patriotism and pride of our American culture. An American worldview promotes the love of, love of faith, family, and freedom. A global worldview is anti-God, anti-family, and anti-America. Any board director who supports this pilot curriculum is at risk of being voted off the school board because they will no longer be trusted with academics of our children. If this curriculum is passed, Central York School District is at risk for losing federal funding because the U.S. government will be notified. Shelva Eller. Rachel Nace. Please read this letter at the Central York School meeting. I, Rachel Nace, a parent of two Central York students, strongly oppose the so-called diversity curriculum and demand the discussion be tabled permanently. Diversity training presented in this way, per the recent diversity resource list, never embraces diversity. It only chooses someone to blame and creates more division. I also propose that the diversity resource list be emailed to every family in Skyward. There needs to be absolute transparency for families to make informed decisions. I am highly disappointed in those of administration that are blindly following a false narrative. Thank you to the board members using critical thinking skills and common sense. Sincerely, Rachel. This one is from Alyssa Williams. Please read aloud my op-ed on YDR. It's a short article. Your opinion, one-sided. In reference to Sam Ruland's article about two conservative CYSD board members, I can, 
I call total bull on this obviously one-sided article. She's biased, no doubt about that. It's ridiculous how she notes how biased two board members are. Her journalism efforts are lacking. I watched that whole meeting online, and those two ladies said nothing demeaning, offensive, or disrespectful. They asked questions that I, as a parent, wanted answers to. The title to the article is twisted. They didn't oppose anti-racism curriculum. They questioned the Marxist-type views that are being incorporated into the diversity program. Ironic that those who demand tolerance are the same ones screaming down people who disagree with them. I don't even want my kids taking this diversity program. My kids are mixed and have my kids are mixed and have all the diversity they need. The schools need to stay out of social politics and concentrate on teaching math, reading, science, etc. And another thing, I don't like being called racist just because I expect my kids to never use the skin color as an excuse not to succeed. They have all the opportunities available to them that everyone else has. If they don't choose to take advantage of those opportunities, it's on them, not the world. It's called personal responsibility. And the schools are teaching our kids that they are either a victim if you're a six-year-old black kid or you're in inherently a racist if you're a six-year-old white kid. Both of these are wrong. Alicia Williams. Christy Hinderer, I'm a mother of a senior football player. I would love for my family to see his last two games he will ever play in. We can easily socially distance and wear a mask like the kids do five days a week inside a building. We are adults and it can easily be done outside. We have been living with this virus for seven months and we all know the rules. For the mental health of these kids, we need to be there to support them. My son said that the hardest thing about playing without fans is the momentum you get when you hear the crowd yelling for you. The worst, he said, is when there is a touchdown. We've had several the past three games, and you don't hear the crowd yelling for us. Please do not let Governor Wolf bully our schools. He makes no money if we open up, and he does not care about our kids. Do the right thing. Thank you, Christy Hinder. Carrie Gaffney. My name is Carrie Gaffney. I am a 1992 Central York graduate and mother of two current Central York football players. I would first like to thank you all for the hard work and countless hours of stress and frustration you have undoubtedly encountered so far this year. I cannot begin to imagine the heavy burdens you're carrying. My purpose in writing is I wish to address the need to mitigate change to previous policy of locking down the campus to parents due to 250 rule in an outdoor stadium and offer two solutions. This dilemma could be navigated in five easy steps. Allow the band to perform exclusively for families at 6 p.m. and then empty the stadium. The band is an important contributor in creating the Friday Night Lights experience. Relocate the band to a soccer field or a different venue, which has unimpeded view of the football field, scoreboard, participation during the game. Band parents can watch and listen from outside the stadium. There are 10 senior cheerleaders. They can cheer for the varsity team and each be given two tickets. 10th and 11th grade cheerleaders can cheer at the JV game on Monday nights. 40 varsity players are allowed to dress for each game and each would be given two tickets. Seat 100 spectators utilizing social distancing mask protocols or the other alternative is even simpler. Distribute two tickets to each player, cheerleader, band member to allow access to the campus. We can social distance, wear masks while surrounding the outside of the stadium and watch through the fence. I believe I speak on behalf of most varsity football parents. We're extremely distressed and disappointed that there's only two home games left and we feel like no one hears our cries of frustration or cares enough to come up with a viable solution. I am pleading with you to please stop locking us out. Please consider a plan which will enable parents the last two home game opportunities to view live performances of their students. Thank you, Carrie Gaffney. Anderson Smith, with the recent ruling of the U.S. Court of Appeals Third Circuit that stayed the previous ruling, it appears the outdoor events and gatherings will be limited to 250 persons for the immediate future. This Friday, Central York School hosts its second home varsity game of the season. With overarching threat of increased COVID-19 restrictions, as well as the rumored proposed state playoff changes forthcoming from PIAA, it is very possible that this will be the only remaining regular season football game that will be hosted at Central York. It is very possible that this could be the only in-person opportunity that the varsity football parents, and especially the senior parents, will have to watch their children play football. There are 24 senior varsity football players, and for the majority of these student athletes this season, and possibly this game, presents a final opportunity for their parents to see them play in person. 
Do the ebb, due to the ebb and flow of the in-person gathering limits, all other athletic teams have allowed spectators at their contests for at least one game this season. Again, every team, with the exception of varsity football, has allowed spectators at one point or another this season. Most teams, such as girls soccer, boys soccer, freshman football, JV football, and field hockey, have allowed spectators at every home contest. What makes varsity football games unique and challenging under the 250 person limit is that CYSD is attempting to combine two events into a single gathering, specifically combining a football game and a band performance into one night. At other YAIAA high schools, a compromise has been reached where the marching band performs in the stadium prior to the football contest and leaves the stadium to allow spectators and parents to attend their child's game. My understanding is that the marching band is a year-round extracurricular activity. Marching band is not limited to two months in the fall or in the case of our COVID year, limited to two potential contests for the remainder of the year. As demonstrated by their performance this past Friday with parents in attendance, the marching band's opportunity to perform is not limited to Friday night football games. I believe I speak for all the parents in the program when I say that the decision by the school to provide tickets to the players' families prior to the ruling from the Third Circuit demonstrates the board's willingness to support our student athletes and their families. I can appreciate that the stadium occupancy limits are not your choice or decision. However, now is the time to find a solution and compromise to fit within the occupancy requirements dictated by the governor. We are not asking for more than, we are not asking for more than the parents of every other sport or extracurricular activity, including marching band, have already been provided with this fall. Thank you for your time and consideration. Best regards, Anderson Smith. Kate Peters. My name is Kate Peters, and I have two students in Century York High School in ninth and 12th grades, both of who lost their spring sport opportunities last season, middle school girls volleyball, high school boys volleyball. I am happy that my daughter is currently allowed to have an athletic season this fall and that I was allowed to attend two home games last week. Parents and families were respectful to the three ticket rule, as well as wearing masks and keeping social distance while in attendance. The news today that we can no longer attend as a spectator is crushing. The person capacity in a small classroom versus a large gymnasium should not be held to the same guidelines. Total allowed occupancy of that said room should be taken into account for determining spectator admission. If restaurants are allowed to have 50% capacity for indoor dining, then why can't a gymnasium with a much larger total capacity have more than 25 people? There are more than 25 people inside grocery stores, retail shopping locations, restaurants, home improvement stores, etc. This makes no sense. Please think long and hard about how total occupancy should play into the ruling on how many are admitted to the games, as well as the double standard that the mandate is imposing on some indoor locations versus others. The support of family and friends means a lot to these developing athletes. Having and, participating in, having and participating in sports is beneficial to my children's mental, physical, emotional, and social well-being, as well as improves their productivity in the classroom. The control and volatility our governor is having over our lives has got to stop. It, it is possible to attend indoor events such as girls' volleyball in a safe manner, masked and spectator attendance based on safe social distance seating guidelines, per the total occupancy of the large gymnasium. Thank you for listening and taking my concerns on indoor athletic event attendance into consideration. But if it must be this way, then I would like to stress that it's important to stream both the varsity game and JV games. Kate Peters. Luis and Heidi Fondes. We can't believe as parents are having to beg to be allowed to watch our children play varsity football. When every other district and when every other school in our district has found a way to abide by 250 rule and still allow parents to watch their children from the stands, would you please follow their lead and allow the football parents in the stands at the last two home games of Central York High School football team? We realize this will take some adjusting, but we are confident if other schools have figured it out, Central will be able to figure it out as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, as time is of the essence. Luis and Heidi. Marja Stroman, very important to address the situation now. There's only two home games left for Central York High School varsity football, and this issue needs to be a priority. I ask that you openly discuss and publicly vote for the parents on this ASAP. Parents and or family members attending varsity football games in the stadium. We have not seen a game in person yet. Parents of varsity football players have sat home, some of us crying and depressed that we don't get to watch our sons play for the last time ever. Limiting the outside stadium to 250 
people is not logical given the space available to social distance, but as a group, you want to uphold Governor Wolf's mandates. This is fine, but now you need to think of parents of this district. You need to think outside the box. The band is an important element of football game. I believe they should attend the game, but not inside the stadium. They can sit on the hill or be located in the soccer area. By removing those 100-plus people, you can allow the parents of football players and cheerleaders to attend the game. It's only fair that we get these last two home games. Band parents have seen players perform twice now in person. It is time to give the varsity football families the same. I know all of us attending would social distance and wear our, our masks. We would even sign a waiver to prevent suing the district. It is time that our school district, Central York, put the families and taxpayers first. Very hurt and sad mother, Marja Stroman. Shane Stroman. We have not seen a game in person yet this season. Parents of varsity football games have sat at home depressed that we don't get to watch our sons play for the last time. As a group, you seem to want to uphold Governor Wolf's recommended mandates. Limiting outside stadium to 250 is not logical given the space available to social distance. I would prefer we use science than a, than a recommendation. These recommendations and mandates make zero sense for what is being allowed to happen across PA. From what I have seen on social media is that other events were held with parents attending in my school district. Why are the parents of the football team being pushed aside? You have said we make no noise to reverse these issues. We have trusted and felt that our appointed members would make the proper decisions for us to obtain a small bit of normalcy that we cling to. Now you and the board are failing us with these yo-yo decisions. You must allow the parents of football players and cheerleaders to attend the games. It is only fair that we get these last two home games. Fan parents have seen the players perform twice in person. It's time to give the same varsity football families the same. Social distancing and wearing masks is, a, is really a no-brainer. I would at this point even sign a waiver to watch my son's final year of sports. It is time that Central York School, School District, Central York, put families and taxpayers first. By the way, don't worry. You can count on us being heard in the future. An upset father, Shane Stroman. Charnette Rolls, I am writing as a parent of a senior varsity football player in regard to the 250 person limit on outdoor events and gatherings. This Friday, Central York High School hosts its second home varsity football game of the season. There are 24 senior varsity football players and at this time we only have two more opportunities on the schedule to watch our children play in person. Every team besides varsity football has allowed spectators at one point or another this season. Most teams such as soccer, Freshman football, JV football, field hockey have allowed spectators at every home contest. Other high schools in the state have compromised between marching band and football and allowed the band to perform in the stadium before the game. Already this fall, the marching band has had a senior night with parents in attendance and performance in the football stadium last Friday with parents in attendance. As a varsity football parent, I would like the same opportunity to watch my child play as has been given every other parent of every other student athlete or marching band member at Century York High School. Thank you for your time and consideration. Charnette Rolls. Shantone Toom. I am writing as a parent of a senior football player in regard to the 250 person limit on outdoor events and gatherings. I have been to every sporting event in every sport in every state my son has played since he was five years old. My streak has been broken. Please do not allow another opportunity to be taken away. This Friday, Central York High School hosts its second home game of the season. There are 24 senior varsity football players at this time. We only have two more opportunities on the schedule to watch our children in person. Every team besides varsity football has allowed spectators at one point or another in the season. Most teams, such as soccer, freshman football, JV football, field spectators at every home contest. Other high schools in the state have compromised between marching band and football and allowed the marching band to perform in the stadium before the football game. Northeastern has a model already this fall that marching band has had a senior night with parents in attendance and a performance in the football stadium last Friday. Um, all right, there was a pause there. Northeastern has a model. Stop. Already this fall, the marching band has had a senior night with parent attendance and a performance in the football stadium last Friday with parents in attendance. As a varsity football parent, I would like the same opportunity to watch my child play as has been given to every other parent of every other student athlete or marching band member. Thank you for your time in Ernst, Shantone, Toom, and family. Mike Hines, we are hoping you will consider implementing to a plan to allow varsity football parents to be permitted to attend two home games. 
We are the only sport that has not been allowed to watch their children in person. We are aware of the safety protocols that must be followed in wearing masks and socially distancing. The stadium holds a voluminous number of fans. We are just asking for parents to be allowed to watch their children play two games. There has to be some kind of solution for this problem. Perhaps there could be substitution of varsity parents, band members to allow the number to remain under 250. There are several entrances and exits to the stadium that should allow for parents to watch the game, band to enter to perform their halftime show, football parents to return following the band's performance. This is the best football team Central has ever had, and I, and to not be able to at least see them play home games is not good for players or parents' mental health. Take it from me. I was an all-county football player for Central in the early 90s and couldn't imagine not having the support of my parents at the games. We should have the right to watch our children, and Governor Wolf's restrictions are unconstitutional. Respectfully, Mike Hines. Rebecca Allison, dear members of the board, with much appreciation for your time and energy you are all bring forward for our kids, particularly during this time, I write to you as a concerned parent. I understand that critical race theory is potentially being introduced through resources in our school's curriculum, and I ask that you take a step back at this time and vote no as they are currently listed. Diversity that promotes unity, not division, is what teaches us love to love one another and begets freedom and abundance for all within our beloved community, county, state, and country. I teach my daughter immeasurably the value of all people at home and do not feel my high schooler or the young ones coming behind her need to have any more feeling of responsibility regarding this issue. I am grateful for the education she receives at Central. We especially have benefited from the opportunities in music and theater, and we as family would love to stay proud of our community schools. While I studied psychology for my undergrad and learned much towards healing our systems of justice in this country, I believe grade school is not the place for theories such as CRT to be addressed. Please teach my child science, math, music, and language. Teach her about the different sides of history equally, but do not take a knee-jerk reaction to current events so recently unfolding and causing so much division, fear, and uncertainty, and bring this to her classroom. I love our district and take pride in our country particularly the diversity in which I grew up and respect we have that enables us to live, love, and work together. I do not believe that adding division under the guise of diversity would benefit our children and the future of our community at this time. My friends, family, and neighbors are all diverse. They are wonderful, and I do not want to see racial issues encouraged among us. Therefore, I ask that you and the faculty continue to teach the values of kindness and respect by modeling them each day, which is among the best interventions for teaching character to children. Please complete a comprehensive resource. Please complete a comprehensive resource list that parents can see that does not include websites, particularly those of BLM. I understand the desire for teachers to have freedom to choose among resources for students, but on this highly complex issue, would like to see a comprehensive list of books and videos that the teachers will or could be utilizing. Some wonderful resources are listed currently, such as biographies on Michelle Obama, MLK, and others. I advocate for more of these empowering stories from which to teach all of our children about heroism and overcoming. Please do not include confusing resources that encourage children to judge one another based on the color of their skin. This is against everything for which America stands, through which I fought a bloody through which it fought a bloody civil war and for which civil rights movement advocates. Please note this interview with civil rights commissioner, Peter, who cites CRT as promoting illegal actions under title seven and calls it the most preconious ideology America has ever seen, which undermines the entire premise of the United States of America. She put a link. Additionally, this goes against my personal value system, which I would hope is of importance to elected board members who are meant to speak for our community. I wish you all the best. And once again, thank you for your service to our community. Sincerely, Becca Allison. Kendra Kakos, good evening. I hope the Central York School Board Administration will act with common sense and allow parents to watch their children's athletic events indoors and out. This can be done safely as it's been demonstrated over the last two weeks. There is more than enough space in our gymnasium to sit six feet apart. I understand it's important to follow rules and laws. Most of us do this all day, every day. However, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And this one is one of those times. Sincerely, Kendra Kakos. Kathy Stale Hughes. My name is Kathy Stale Hughes. I'm a mother of a 2019 grad 
have two in the class of 2024 and one in 2025. The heartbreak our children and families have felt over all the last moments this pandemic has caused are numerous. Please don't add another one. I know to some it's just a football game, seven games out of hundreds that we've watched as parents. Those games were so much more to our family. It was 84 high school games we traveled for over four years with three generations. They were precious hours spent in the stands with my family who passed last month and given the chance he would have been in those stands to watch my twins play their freshman year. Don't take these moments from people. They are immeasurable. Allow the parents of varsity players the opportunity to sit and cheer for their boys, the cheer parents to watch their girls and guys do what they love. Allow the kids to look up in the stands and see their family proudly watching them. They can do this with social distance to the other side if necessary. If I had a student there on Friday night, I would be willing to sit or stand anywhere inside to support my students. Central has been a great district that tries to consistently meet all student needs. This is a student need. Thank you for your time, Kathy. This is a long one, Ms. Johnson. Last one. Uh, Lorraine Smith. I am writing on a indoor 250 outdoor spectator limit. Unfortunately, I do not think this is going to change for the fall season. I think it is time for Central York to think outside the box during these unprecedented times. At this point, I feel simply just not allowing parents into the varsity game is an unacceptable solution. I think it's time for all of us to creatively come together concerning Friday nights as we are simply running out of time. Friday night poses the most challenge to the school with regard to allowing parents to attend their children's events as we are attempting to host three events and teams in one stadium. Varsity football, varsity cheer, and band. Although this is the way Central York High School has always scheduled Friday evenings, I feel we need to think outside the box this year to allow for not only parents to be able to support their children, but to also to assist with many of the cuts that have occurred for football and band this fall. Many other schools in the area have come up with creative ways to allow for both band and football parents to be able to support their children. So it has been proven to be able to be done and has proven to be successful. There are several solutions to this problem that I can think of. Central can adopt a plan similar to Northeastern School District. She attached it. Northeastern School District has a band show prior to the home football games with band and band parents inside the stadium. After the band show, the band and band parents exit the stadium and then the football team and football players' parents come into the stadium for the game. Another solution would be to have the band perform outside the stadium by setting up Bleachers or chairs at the end field past the goal, but toward the fence with the band facing the football stadium. The band would have a very good view of the football field and would be able to play for the team from outside the stadium, thus in a separate venue. The band would be heard throughout the football stadium. Band parents could sit in the soccer bleachers and would be able to hear the performance and be able to support their band members in person. If they are not permitted to be on the soccer field, the same scenario can happen at the opposite side of the stadium behind the scoreboard there's plenty of room to set up pop-up bleachers or chairs for the band and band parents, thus giving members of the band an unimpeded view of the football field. A third solution would be to allow the band to perform at another venue. In a year of so much change and uncertainty, why not allow the band to perform at home girls soccer games, home boys soccer games, a home field hockey game, and perhaps one or two home lacrosse games? All of Central sports teams have great success, many of them making it to and winning county and district championships the past few years. How awesome would it be for those teams to experience the hype that the band brings to a game? This solution would not only allow for band parents to attend, but would allow for more band members to not have to be cut from the band as they could or either have alternate performances or depending on the venue, allow for the entire band and band parents to be present. Varsity football and varsity cheer are the only programs that have not had parents able to attend and support their children's games performances this fall. The varsity football program has 24 seniors this year, so this is 24 families' last chance to be able to watch their children play in person and to be there to support their children. We have unselfishly supported our children throughout their lives with their year-round vigorous training and practice regimens all to get them to this, their senior year of high school football. We have foregone family holidays, vacations year-round so that they did not miss a day of practice or training. We are now simply pleading for two home games, two opportunities to see them in their final year of the sport they are so passionate about. As a result of the 250 outdoor limit, we have senior football players who have been training and playing for years that have yet to have 
been able to suit up and attend a game this year. So not only do their parents miss out on their child's senior year of play, the players themselves are missing out on the last opportunities to play a sport they're so passionate about. I am one of the team parents for the varsity football team this year and very concerned for the varsity football parents who are beyond distraught and frustrated at this point. We have all suffered many sleepless nights and feel beyond hopeless at this point. We all completely support the varsity cheer and band, but we feel the band has already had opportunities this year for parents to attend performances, and they do have other opportunities to perform this year. The band hosted a senior night, and the band hosted an event with parents past Friday night. Century York was able to think outside the box for the band for those two events. We are simply asking for the same courtesy in return. At a very minimum, we are asking that at least the parents of senior football players and senior cheerleaders are permitted tickets to see their children play perform in person for the two remaining home games this year. At this point, we may only have one home game remaining due to rumored PIAA schedule changes for playoffs. This Friday may be the only chance, our last chance, to be there to support our players. One more paragraph. Please know that as a parent of a student enrolled in Central York, I more than appreciate all that you, the administrators and teachers, have done this year for every single student enrolled in the school. I feel that you've done an incredible job of having our children return to school safely and keeping them in school safely while continuing to challenge them academically. I also appreciate all that you have done to provide them with so many experiences that have allowed them to have as, as a normal of a year as possible considering the circumstances schools are facing. Thank you for your willingness to come up with creative plans this year for all of our students. I am hopeful that you will think outside the box to come up with a creative solution that allows for parents and spectators for varsity football and varsity cheer for the remaining two home games. I do feel that as a community, we can all come together to make this a great year to be a Panther. Best regards, Lorraine Smith. That was all. All right, at this point, we're moving on to uh, discussion items. Mr. Snell, do you want to start with the yes, athletic plan? Thank you. Um, before you and attached in um, board docs is the uh, PK-12 athletic health and safety plan template. Uh, as a way of a, a little bit of a history, we approved the first version of this on June 29th here. Um, and that was, if you recall, in order to get our athletes up and ready to begin just after the start of July. And I think we waited till just after July 4th. And so our first iteration of this plan was um, done so prior to this template. In the ensuing months, this template has come out. We've not revisited it. I'm sure we all can agree that this decision has changed 14 times and hopefully won't change 14 more. Um, but it's our hesitation is exactly what point do we execute and begin to bring this before you. And so let me just walk you through the document here quickly. Um, you will see that there are key strategies, policies, and procedures, and there are four major areas, cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and ventilation. Uh, Mr. Kessler and his group filled this form out. It is comparable to the previous one, but also includes some other cleaning, sanitation, et cetera, guidelines that come out of the health and safety plan. So just for everybody's refresher, there's a health and safety plan, which we've approved, and then there's an athletic health and safety plan. They sort of look very similar. Um, so all of those cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, ventilation pieces were taken in from the health and safety plan, as well as from the printing questions. But what I would like to do is to draw your attention to page 10, please, Mr. Kessler, if you would open that up. And anybody that has it at home or around the table here, page 10. There's been a change uh, as of today, working closely with our solicitor and our board president, Ms. Johnson. Um, we are recommending the following language under the category of identifying and restricting non-essential visitors and volunteers. Um, for the most part, limited to staff events. So in our, all of our cases so far, we've tried to have the minimum amount of staff necessary to run the event. And this line was added. Any spectators must wear masks, observe CDC protocols, and maintain social distancing. Spectators will be limited to the allowable number per social distancing in each venue. So that is the change that has been added to the health and safety plan for your consideration. Um, obviously, if it meets with your approval, uh, we would uh, look to turn around here in a little bit and take action on that as we have events uh, tonight and going forward, as our families have clearly said this Friday uh, as well. And so, again, any spectator must wear a mask, observe CDC protocols, maintain social distancing. Spectators will be limited to the allowable number per social distance in each venue. And in each of our venues, we have gone through the six foot protocol, if you will, to determine how many spectators we can reasonably fit in there, maintaining you know, the CDC protocols, social distancing, everybody must wear a mask, all of which I think our families would gratefully do. 
Um, and so that is the, the entirety of the plan, again, is not quite um, as exciting as that statement for your approval. So I'll be happy to answer any questions about that piece. And credit again to Ms. Johnson and uh, our solicitor for working through In English for the parents that have expressed concerns and for everybody else, this will allow parents to attend, for instance, uh, football games that we've heard so much about, yes, correct? Sir. We, we've, um, we've said earlier three tickets per football player, a uh, band uh, player, and cheerleader. And that's what I got out of it, but I wanted to make yes, sure sir. that people Absolutely. understood in that's plain language that's what straight it Straightforward. Yes, Thank sir. you. So I guess so I understand as well, Uncle Dr. Snell, to make sure this is then, although I think I disagree with the 250 number, sure. but it wasn't overturned by a veto. The veto was not overturned. Right. This is going against the 250 person limit, this plan. Uh, it, in one respect, yes, but it's also honoring social distancing. And, I, and again, it's that, a, yeah, I get, I get yeah. that. I just want to yes, make sir. sure I understood that. Yes, Thank sir. you. And the magical words I also heard was this was re reviewed and approved with our solicitor, correct, yes, who yes, has got many decades, well, decades of experience mm -hmm. in education law and certainly these mandates. And uh, uh, basically, Stock and Leader has blessed this for us, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Push. I guess we're going to take a vote on this, correct? Okay, in the action, thank you. Yes. So I, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, the tickets, we're, we're going by the tickets. So if soccer, will that still be only three tickets because it is outside? Yes. All of those, the ticket numbers that we've identified up until this point, took a look at how many we could put in, in, this, in the uh, soccer stadium, which is 115. So what we do is we take the number of athletes, divide it, and come up with simply three tickets or four tickets, whatever that might be. Okay, because like at a soccer game across the, the field, there's nobody in the away stands. We're only using the home stands. Is there an away stand? There's no? Okay, There's no. sorry about that. <laughs> I thought you were convincing me. Maybe I, I thought we did have stands over there. I would prefer if Marty Trimmer would build an away stand. <laughs> I was unaware of that. But for football, we're using... <laughs> football, we're using this... Excuse me, football, we're using the away stands... Yes, ma'am, for, for the home. Yep, and all capacity limits are based on seating. That was a clarification, and again, that's a legal... Um, definition. So everything is based on the venue and the amount of seating that we have. I just ask because I'm 100% for this and make no doubt, but how are we getting past what I read to be the, the overturning of the order? It, it, what was this question? So, you know, in our conversation with stock and leader today, um, we went through that. And I think one of the biggest concerns right now is that because it's an ever changing, um, ever changing situation that at any point in time, I don't know that. Um, I mean, if at some point there were some serious um, consequences pushed down to the district, um, you know, in the next day, the next week, I mean, it's changing all the time, you know, we would reconsider and reevaluate. But at this point in time, going forward, there are, and then there are a number of districts that are also allowing stands in the fan, fans in the stands. I can't say it. Yeah, I, I'm hopeful the governor and has, has alluded to the fact that there is some relief potentially coming. I'd like for it to be sooner than later. So I, I think maybe there'll be some relief there as well. But other school districts have taken similar action. And this comes from our solicitor. Well, I commend you for standing up We're trying. and doing it. Thank We're you. Trying. Give credit to both our solicitor and the board president. And the chart that he has over there, is, it's not included on here, but where can the parents find it? We're talking about what, if we vote this in tonight. I didn't hear. I'm sorry. The, the chart with the ticket numbers yes, and sir. stuff, just so that people could be able to find it if we vote in this as a um, Yeah, we didn't. I don't think that's included. That's sort of an internal document. We've communicated, I think, with all the athletes what the number of tickets are. Um, should that change for whatever um, um, procedure evening, it might increase the tickets. But in the very least, if we had to go 675, it would be three. It might, it could increase based on homecoming, band, and all of those. They're variables. 
but that's what we can at least say at 675. This is yes, the same chart that I think has gone out in yes, Julie's weekly newsletters has been pretty widely distributed, correct? correct? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. And again, what we tried to do was take a look at all the venues so that, as, you know, the, the, the scary thing will be coming into winter sports and, we'll, you know, here we go again. We've tried to take a look at the venue. Um, and, and I think, you know, we've not taken a look at upstairs, but that's, you know, volleyball at this point doesn't need an upstairs. And we went with, what was it, 115? Um, no, that was soccer. I apologize. So we're trying to take a look at all of our various venues so that this could sort of be replicated. Ultimately, the six feet isn't a direct number, but it enables us to, short of any state or federal other rulings coming down, it enables us to work off of a number and enable our families to come. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, I'm uh, moving on to uh, summer food service update. I'd like to call uh, Ms. Ansel forward and Emily Stump our food service director, come on forward. Yeah, please both come on up. Um, annually, we uh, give you an update on the summer food service program. Um, obviously this summer, it was a little different and um, there um, was a continuation obviously from the shutdown uh, into the summer program. There's obviously a continuation here. So I know Ms. Ansel isn't gonna go through the normal uh, procedure as to this is just what happened this summer. We're also gonna talk about the spring and the fall and all of that, but this is an annual update um, for your um, enjoyment. <laughs> I was gonna say entertainment. And just a quick note, we did post these slides. So as we're displaying them here, they are posted in board docs um, for the public to follow along or to see as well. Good evening, thank you, Dr. Snell. Um, as Dr. Snell mentioned, I have Emily Stump with me, our food service director tonight, who has been instrumental in the success of our summer food service program over the five years. So she's here to help answer any questions that you may have. Um, just as a brief history overview of the program in general, this program is a federally funded program that's been in existence for, since 1976. So it's been around for many years. It's operated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and administered by each state. So PDE administers our program. Um, the purpose of the program is to ensure that kids have access to healthy, nutritious meals when school is not in session. Um, it provides free meals to kids 18 and under, and then our district receives a federal subsidy for each meal that is served. So Central York filed back in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2016 for a five-year approval. And this past summer was year five of that five-year um, approval through PDE. Some of the rules of the program are that students have to eat on site their meals. They cannot take food home with them. Um, if you want to serve multiple meals, which we in the past have only done lunch, but if you would want to do multiple meals, you would have to have a time period between those meals. For example, you could have a time frame for breakfast and they would have to come back later and, and have a lunch meal. This program is accounted for separately within our food service fund. So we have a separate chart of account numbers so we can pull the financial data separately, but it still is part of our food service fund. So as Dr. Snell said, um, this year looked a lot different for our summer food service program than prior years. And it started in the spring of 2020 when school districts closed down the USDA issued waivers of all of the rules that I just mentioned, of that you have to eat on site and you can't take food home. So they waived um, all of those rules and allowed for distribution of meals for parents to pick up. Um, they could pick up up to two meals per day. And then we could also bundle the meals and send it home for the next day. So on March 16th, the first day that we were closed, we were able to start distributing lunch Monday through five, Friday at um, our three normal summer food service program uh, locations, Stony Brook, Hayshire, and York Learning Center. And then we were also able to add the high school as a distribution location because that building is located within the eligibility map of USDA's No, Hungry, um, no Kid Hungry eligibility map. And so without having to get approval that the high school qualified and it's centrally located within our district. And so it was a, um, another opportunity, a distribution location opportunity for us. The second week we added breakfast meals to the distribution and also covered meals for the weekend. So this waiver allowed for meals to be distributed for uh, seven days a week. The second um, 
the, I'm sorry, the third week that we were open, we still continue to distribute me meals for covering all seven days of the week, breakfast and lunch. And we did that through the end of the school year, but we only distributed on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to limit the exposure for our staff and volunteers. So then if we jump to the fall for a minute, um, in early September, the USDA issued another nationwide waiver allowing school districts to operate the summer food service program through December 31st. So we implemented that program on September 10th, which means that all of our students receive free meals, breakfast and lunch, regardless if you're a traditional learner or if you're a remote learner. And as a reminder, our remote learners can pick up breakfast and lunch meals on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at Stony Brook and Hayshire, and those meals cover um, all the weekdays. So they receive extra food on Monday and Wednesday to cover all five days. And that program, um, pickup program is from 1130 to 1230 on those days. So now I'll go to the, the actual summer program. Um, so we, are, we have um, in 2016 through 2019, we served lunch Mondays through Thursdays at our three locations that we currently have. Um, then this year, 2020, looked a lot different. We continued uh, the distribution process um, with the USDA waiver. The only thing different in the summer was that it was limited to weekdays. In the spring, we could do seven days a week. And then in the summer and fall, it's just weekdays. So we distributed breakfast and lunch to cover um, every weekday this summer, but we only distributed on Mondays and Wednesdays. So we had the same three locations. So it was a 10 week program. And during that 10 weeks, we distributed 50 breakfast meals and 50 lunch meals for a total of 100 meals, which is, as you'll see on the next slide, um, a lot more than what we normally are able to, to serve. So I, I don't know if you can tell, but in the red at the top um, is the number of days and also number of meals each year that we were able to serve. So um, for example, back in 2016, we operated for 30 days, and that is um, 30 lunches. And fast forwarding to 2020, we were, we were open 50 days serving two meals per day. So that's 100 meals compared to what you can see that we did in the, the previous years. On the chart, you'll see the number of meals and how much um, it increased uh, over those uh, five years for the big increase this past summer. This is the average daily meal served. Again, uh, Hayshire and Stony Brook had a big increase in their number of meals distributed. So this is the financial summary for just the, the months of June, July, and August. Again, because of the increase in the number of meals served, our federal subsidy increased. Uh, that totaled almost $156,000. And you'll see their expenses as well for salaries and benefits, food, electricity, that totaled 113,000 for a net income of 43,263 just for the summer months. Um, our uh, food service fund experienced a loss this school year because of being closed for um, the middle of March through the end of May. And so this income helped to lower that loss, if you will, that we experienced. Our loss is about 115,000 that we had for the school year in our food service fund. This slide shows you the, um, the financial summary by year. Normally the program is uh, break even. That's the expectation from the USDA and that's uh, the last several years, how it turned out for us. Um, of course this year, for all the reasons that I just mentioned, we had a, a profit. This slide shows the number of volunteers that we had each at each building each year. Um, the first four years, we served lunch, as I had mentioned, between 12 and 1. So our volunteers would come in around 11.45 and stay until about 1.15. They would help, um, help serve the food, help monitor the students, help clean up. So they were here for about an hour and a half. This year, the, the um, increase in volunteer hours uh, was due to the fact that our volunteers came about 8 a.m., and they were here till about 1.15 or 1.30. So for about five hours a day, um, we had to bag up uh, meals and bundle them and, and distribute them. So it was a lot of work. So our volunteers um, are uh, very helpful to us. They, they're very instrumental in the success of our program. Um, they are 
consist of students, parents, staff members, all of our adults have their clearances, their volunteer clearances that we work with Ms. Billman and we make sure that they have those on file um, before they volunteer for us. Uh, so we would recommend that we would continue, we submit a new request for a five-year approval through PDE to continue operating the program in 2021 at our same three locations. Um, and I will just say that back in the spring, whenever the school closed, we, um, sorry, it's hard to breathe. Um, we were able to pretty uh, easily transition into distributing food uh, because we had a summer food service program already in place and approved. So it was a pretty seamless transition to be able to start distributing that food the first day that we were closed. So that was a, a big benefit to our district. Um, also, it's, it's an opportunity for our students to get volunteer hours. Um, it's an opportunity for, we have staff members that we hire during the summer. And then um, as we've heard in the past, also for our families to, you know, it helps them as well during the summer months. So I appreciate your support over the last five years. Uh, thank you so much for that. And we look forward to hopefully continuing the program in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hansel. Um, at this time, I have many of the board members have any questions. This would be the time. Ms. Guth. I'm just curious, are, are these meals limited to students of the district or do you do any kind of, any kind of um, screening to see who's coming or is it just open and anybody who shows up? You mean currently for a remote learner pickup? No, I'm talking yeah. about in general. Oh, in general. When someone comes, you don't ask them a whole bunch of questions about where they live or are Correct. they in the district or how old they are or that kind of thing. Correct. It's the same as, as every year that they come and if they appear to be 18 or younger, we, we give them the meal. Okay, so we don't know whether we're feeding a lot of children who are outside the district. And I'm not making a value judgment. I'm just trying to determine how, what percentage of the students who go there are central mm -hmm. district mm -hmm. students. So, you know, just more curiosity as to how the system works. Thank you. Yes. There is. I'll come. I can't comment for this past summer, but the summer before I was spent a lot of time at Stony Brook and I think we knew there were some students from the Eastern York School District because of the proximity mm -hmm. of that. But what's interesting, it's it's the federal funding piece. So it's everybody's federal funds that's funding it. So it didn't probably make as much of a difference if it was funded differently to me at least. I had a question um, looking at the charts. So are we not serving, we're only serving meals right now at um, for remote learners at Stony Brook and Hayshire? Correct. And how is that working out? Do we find that there, there are people over at the Learning Center that are wondering what happened to, because all summer they were, they were receiving meals, right? Is there any concern with that? I haven't heard any concern with that. Have you, Emily? I haven't had a concern at all. No. Mm -hmm. our, um, our remote learner meal pickup um, is, I think I shared that at an update a week or so ago. Um, at Hayshire, we have approximately 80 parents that are taking advantage of that, and Stony Brook, approximately 30. So it is a low percentage at this point. And then lastly, um, the income from um, June to August. If this is federally funded money, is there any concern that we have to give it back? Well, I, I just pulled a snapshot of the summer months just for um, comparing the five years. If you look at the summer oh, food service not. program funding starting in March through, we would have a loss. Okay, that's what I thought. So that yeah. number just really stuck out to me. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. Will this come back to us? Um, February, I think we were looking at early. Keep trying, keep trying. <laughs> I'm just going to yell. Um, our anticipation would be to come back in February. Mm -hmm. um, seeking your approval, that gives us a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Make sure that we apply for it and we're in good stead. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much for your, um, for your work in getting these kids um, taken care of all summer. All thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Unemployment compensation. Mr. Kessler, Mr. Kessler, annual uh, item, would you please give us the update? Certainly, and you can see we posted some notes. Um, we update the numbers. So we work with um, the vendor, this interstate tax service. They've been doing it for many, many years. They are experts in the unemployment compensation. They benefit both Ms. Billman's office and the business office. Um, we're very pleased with them. They've sat in, on our behalf and, and helped us through many cases and situations. So there's no increase. Um, same small fee that we have built in. Uh, and so we would just look for the annual renewal. It's effective every calendar year. So January 1 through December. So that's it. Okay. Uh, Any questions from Mr. Kessler? Okay. Moving along, <clears throat> we have the last thing, uh, policies. Okay. So, um, Here's our first read of some policies. Um, they're all attached here on the agenda. Uh, the policy um, committee, which is now our newly formed policy committee, uh, meets as a public meeting and um, reviews the policy. And these are the ones that we're recommending to put, push forward for a first read. What was the date of our meeting? We had one meeting, it was- uh, September 24th, 28th. I'll tell okay. you just one second. 14th. Okay, October 16th. So this is this is the Sometime. results of the October 16th. September, uh, September. okay, we'll go September. Right. So um, are there any um, comments about the policies here? Okay. Try it a couple of times, Mr. Lewis. Yeah. One more. There you go. Push the button. I was pretty good at that once. I don't I need an answer. I read all these. I, don't, I didn't see my question. Is CBD oil non-THC? Is possession of that a offense? Yeah. Right? CBD oil is, with, I've asked that question, Amber, isn't it without THC? I believe that it can. Doesn't always, but yeah, I think that it can. It's totally legal. I'm just, but yeah. We'll make sure. Saw everything else under the sun, yeah. including. Yeah. Correct. But I'll make sure. I don't want to speak out of turn. We'll make sure. See if you do. Yeah, we'll get an answer. We'll get an answer. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, Mr. King. No, that's fine. Just for the public's sake, I believe pretty much all of the changes to the policies were based on legislative updates. Is that correct? I believe so. Most. Yep, one more. One more, Jane. Was it, um, uh, I reviewed them all, but I don't remember which one. Uh, crowdfunding was a new one. Uh, they were all mandates. Okay. Okay, so these will be back. Oh, Mr. Wagner, I'm yeah, sorry. I'll, I, I know I asked. Dr. Snell question you, and I never did see that response, so it may have gotten lost somehow. And it's just not that I disagree, not that I understand. There's just some terminology in the, I think, the employee tobacco and vaping piece about we reserve the right, I guess it's from an 18 to a 21-year-old employee that may possess cigarettes, I'll say, we reserve the right to cite the employee. And it didn't sound like cite was the appropriate term there, but I don't know. It's That sounds like we... Yeah. have the legal authority to issue yes, a sir. citation. Yes, sir. It's a, a legal it, citation. It's a summary citation. It's As a school district. Yes, sir. Wow. Okay. Um, we, that's been in place for a number of years. I believe originally it was called Act 26 way back in the day when a student um, underage has cigarettes. You file a non-summary citation, I think, is, and you'll end up at the district magistrate through all of that. So that's the, the site. So the the electronic devices, it says here that the board prohibits use of electronic devices by students during the school day in the district buildings. And when I was looking at the, the notes, it just said that basically this policy was just updating the names of the devices. Is the previous policy that we have right now prohibiting use of electronic devices during the school day for students? 
Is that correct? That, that did not change. That didn't change? No, ma'am. But we do have students using their phones constantly through the day. And I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, who, the policy committee, we, we did have some conversations about this. And I, I, I know that there are exceptions in the policy here. At the end of the policy, there are exceptions. Of course, we all know that it's tough to keep these kids off their phones and classroom management is key to that. Um, it's also um, something that uh, it becomes a, a, a problem, you know, it's done, handled on a case by, by case, I guess. And with these exceptions here, um, we leave it, like I said, to the, to the discretion of the teachers. And um, that's how the policy is as it was, with exception. So is there any way to add in the policy to have all of the teachers using the same role in their classroom? I mean, I don't mind that the kids are using their phones to look as long as they're not taking pictures and showing obscene videos during lunch. But I think the, the phones need to be hidden and put away when it is time for the teacher to do their instruction part. I mean, does anybody have any problems with that? Or am I the only one that thinks that teachers should all be on the same page when it comes to enforcing the phones? Because I don't think it's happening now. Yeah, I mean, I'm on the policy committee and we had a big discussion about this and I'm still troubled because the policy says the board prohibits, and then it says it's up to the building superintendent or building administrator, which would be the principals. And then the handbook says the teachers can decide. And, and I know from having a student that there's total inconsistency. So I would like to see the principals, and, and I think it can be different for different age groups, different levels, or, but I would think that the building principals should have a policy for their faculty that was fairly consistent because when kids go from one classroom to another and the rules are totally different, I think it sends a bad message as to what are rules and who's going to enforce what. So anyway, we talked about it at the policy meeting, but I don't think it wasn't sat, uh, resolved to my satisfaction because I agree with, with Ms. Grothy that there needs to be some consistency within at least a school building. And we as the board delegated that to the principals. I don't know how it got delegated to the teachers, but that's kind of what the handbook says. And, and I'm just thinking that it should really stay the way it is that the principals can make a policy and they should ask their teachers to implement it unless there are special circumstances. Like if it's a particular class where that policy wouldn't make sense, they can have an exception. But I don't think each teacher should be able to make their own exceptions based on how they like to interact with their kids. It sends the bad message to the students. I, I think it deters the I mean, if you're going to say that the board is prohibiting it and then the principal says, oh, OK, you, you can have your phones out. It, it completely deters what we're what we're saying as a board in this policy. So I, I just asked for some stricter guidelines and rules while the kids are in their classroom. The phone should be hidden and there shouldn't be any any reason for them to be out. I mean, I know in the middle school. They are pretty strict that the phones need to be in their backpacks and hidden, but I know it's very loosey goosey in the, in the high school. So, and you know, inappropriate things are being shown. And I, you know, I would like to just say that that needs to be enforced. So under the authority, it says the board prohibits use of, and then you scroll down and it says that the consequence can be confiscation until the conference with the principal or parent or teacher or whatever, whoever that has the kinds gets violations of this policy by a student shall result in disciplinary action and shall result in confiscation of the ele electronic device. And we know that doesn't happen. 
The confiscated items shall not be returned until a conference has been held with a parent or guardian. And that is a simple violation of this policy of using electronic devices by students during the school day in district buildings on district property during the time students are under supervision of the district or in the locker rooms, bathrooms, health suites, etc. Yeah, we had a lengthy conversation about this at our policy committee, um, but it didn't seem that we could budget, not budget, but budge it from having more consistency across the board per building. And so teachers can have consistency and everybody's on the same page and students know what to expect. So, and maybe it's not the teachers. Maybe the teachers are really trying to enforce it. I'm sure that there are very good teachers that are enforcing it and they send their students down to um, you know, the office and the principals do nothing. They don't confiscate the phone or take it for the day because maybe they're in fear that, you know, parents are going to freak out. But I really would like to be, have a very solid rule on this. And, you know, we just have so many different social medias out there that are so dangerous. And I think while we're in school, the distractions should be at a very minimum. And we should not allow them to have their devices while they are in the classroom supposed to be learning. And I, I really hope that if we have to change the wording to this, I, I, I think we should. Mr. Speed. Just if you read it the way it's written, then when superintendent or does need develop the administration regulation to implement the policy, the policy should, said, should say no one can use their phones or electronic devices, period. Right. That I mean, that if the board is going to stick by, we as the board are going to say that we're going to say you, you can't use these devices, then their policy that goes in the handbook that goes out that we approve should say you can't use your device. If it doesn't say that, we shouldn't approve that that goes out to the from the handbook. The handbook should not be approved. That's simply what it says. That means that they're not developing the policy as we've written it, period. And we shouldn't approve that policy in the handbook. Now, if we want to go back and change it and say, here are the cases that they can or we should or not be such a hard line, then we need to change this the wording. <laughs> didn't we, um, when we were in the policy committee, didn't we go back and look at the handbooks for the different grade? You know, so we have a handbook at the high school. We have a handbook at the middle school. Didn't we review that? And I thought we came to some level of satisfaction with what was passed down at the, at the school level. That these documents, like so many, are just a, a broad um, uh, policy and that the specifics are carried out down in some other location. Do you, rem do you guys remember th that part of the conversation? I'm, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. I'm concerned about phone usage. I think it gets over the top. The, and I that part so. of the conversation was pushed to the policy, saying that we're not going to deal with it till we deal with the policy. So under the current policy, and this is the reading of that policy, then basically you're saying that that handbook is invalid because no, it's not No, I'm not, not saying actually, anything. I'm no, I mean saying. the policy is. The policy that is written here now says that the, that the handbook is currently issued saying that people can use their phones at any period of school is invalid. Is invalid. It's not the interpretation, it strictly says you cannot do this. So therefore anything written by the superintendent and his designee should say, you cannot do this. And that's not interpreted. That says you should not do this. And that means the principal should be going around collecting phones. I don't care if it's a teacher or not, whoever, this, that as far as it's not dependent upon the teacher, it's not dependent upon the principal. We're saying right now in this, that you cannot do this now. If we want to change it and say we're going to leave it open so that the superintendent and the and that the principals can come up with their own rules and regulations about it, then we need to change that first line. Okay, well, you're talking about the purpose, the very first line? Yes. Uh, on purpose, it says aborted. Oh, Authority. It says You're authority. The authority. board prohibits. Okay. I'm just trying to get where you are. Yeah, that's right. So it says the board prohibits. We need to change that to say 
the board concedes or defers or says something to the policies that the superintendent that we approve in the handbook, blah, 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 blah. But if we say that we prohibit it, that we don't allow them any wiggle room or anything to be able to give any kind of policy. If that's, that's, that's what you really want to say, that you want to prohibit it, then, then they have to say we prohibit it. Okay, so what about when you go down to the exceptions? I'm, and I'm just trying to you know, work through this with you guys. I'm not asking. Under exceptions, it says other reasons to uh, determine appropriate by a building principal. So if a building principal says my staff is going to be able to delegate or they're going to be able to um, um, implement, uh, say, a no phone usage in their classroom, um, except under these exceptions. And the teachers don't have a problem with the students and their phones, and they're successful, then I think the policy would be okay because the policy is at a higher level, and then there are some exceptions. But I do hear what you're saying. I do believe that our, our um, teachers need the support of the principals to be able to say, listen, if this classroom is no phones, put them in a basket, they can do that. And I think there are teachers that do that. Um, so uh, I'm not. And, our, and our, our principals would support that. Yeah. My read on this conversation as it's developed so far is this policy is not ripe to proceed further because there are obviously serious concerns by a significant, significant number of the board members. And I suggest what we probably ought to do with it is send it back to the policy committee because what we're doing right now is the policy committee's job in a board meeting. I, I agree with that. And um, just to make everybody aware, major concerns with, and you can talk to the resource officer at the high school that also goes to the middle school her biggest complaint is students sending nude photos of other students and, and they do get in trouble with the police for that. Um, and when I was in the high school just recently, you know, I had asked her, is that a problem? And they said, Oh no, that's a middle school problem. So I actually, my mouth dropped underneath my mask, but seriously, if the middle school kids are doing that now, that's really something that we we need to be concerned about. Uh, I agree 100%. And I, you know, do not object to Mr. Um, Gothi's request. Um, I mean, I thought when we came, brought it forward, we were satisfied. I'm not sure. Um, we have to go back to the handbook. But again, you know, we can also follow up with our council um, on other policy, you know, policies to try and maybe do some wordsmithing. Um, but one of the things I will say, and I, and, and it's unfortunate, but kids are going to do that stuff, whether they're doing it in school or they're doing it up in their room or whether they're doing it on the way to the bus stop or they're, you know, they're going to do it. I agree with what you're saying about having an opportunity to enforce this and do it well, because I, you know, I do want our staff to feel like they are supported when a student is giving them a hard time, it, you know, when they don't want to respond and put it away and you keep saying, put it away and you send them to the office and, you know. Just quickly, Jane, if I can. I, I, I'm sorry, that's why I'm over there. He got the lights. So okay, I win. <laughs> I, I pretty much agree with Joe that sending back the policy committee because I think some of the people would have concerns, like we all may about this issue, are on the policy committee. One thing we have to be aware of, when it comes back to the board, we will probably still go back into this same discussion because each of us has to vote and it's just not rubber stamped. The policy committee. And one of the things this policy does, and I think kind of to Ed's thing, it gets pretty far reaching whenever students are under supervision of someone in the district. And that puts it on a band bus going to a football game next year, I guess, or in the stands or all those different things. It puts it, it, it reaches that far down under the authority piece. So that can get a little tricky as well, anytime on school property or under the school supervision. And I think if you look at the exceptions, they're everything. Because the last exception says other reasons determined appropriate by the building principal, which is anything. And I would just like to know, do the building principals have any policies that they have shared with their staff? Because I, my sense is that every teacher is just, just has their own policy. That's what I've heard from the students that I interact with, that it's a personal choice of the teachers 
and some have no restrictions, others have restrictions. And I think that's, you know, when you're raising children or supervising children, you need to be consistent. Okay. We had this long discussion and we couldn't come to a conclusion. And okay. so it just. Okay. So one of the things we talked about when we wanted to go back to having a policy committee so that we could, you know, take care of this business in, a, in another public forum. And when we talked about putting the committee together, we said, you know, it would be a nice opportunity. If there's a particular policy that we would like to have input from particular people in our, um, in our buildings, a principal or whatever. So, I say that we revisit this, we bring it back at our next policy meeting, which is on my calendar. I think it's October 28th. No, it's not till December. It's, it's, December it's on here. I, I have it. I need my glasses. Um, that, December 3rd. So we will have, um, we'll either get our principals to provide their information, whether it's you know something that they write to their staff or have them present in the room to talk about the issues that they face with dealing with the phone. So that way um, we'll make sure that we are hearing maybe anything they have to say and also at the same time, finding a way to fine tune this a little bit. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so we will take that one off and we'll bring the rest forward at our next meeting. Which wherever that is. 19th. The 19th. Yes ma'am, 19th. All right. At this point, and is there any more comments? Okay, moving on to our action items. Um, we will take uh, item 8.01. It is recommended the board approve the update to the Central York Athletic Health and Safety Plan as presented. Is there any discussion? Mr. Wagner. I'm going to comment. Yeah. Um, I wish the state legislature, I guess the House really had come up with enough votes to override the governor's veto. I wish the governor had not appealed, but both of those things did occur. Um, so really enforceable or not, the rule out there is 250. Um, similar to enforceable or not on electronic devices, the rule out there is prohibit. I think we're sending a mixed message just finishing that discussion and going into this discussion. I don't necessarily agree with the 250 rule. I think it can be done safely, but that's the rule right now. So I'm going to probably, I will be voting. I'm not supporting the revised plan. I'm relying on the advice of council and I'm voting yes. Okay. So at this point, Mr. Um Mr. Wagner has um, voiced his um, opinion. Is there any other votes to the contrary? Those comments before. Yeah, messing my flow. Three times. Just to confirm all the concerns we heard from the seniors that are playing football and being an old high school football player, but we are going to acknowledge and do everything within our power to give those senior families under this plan, the tickets they need so they can see their kids play. I yes, heard that loud and clear, correct? More than the seniors, yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so there's no other votes to the contrary. Then the motion passes. Second item 8.02. It is re recommended the board affirm and adopt the findings of fact relative to the following student disciplinary hearing as presented. So moved. Sorry. Any discussion? Any votes to the contrary? Okay. Motion passes. Oh, I guess it's motion. All right. Regular uh, meeting agenda review. So next meeting. So these the, our policies will our policies will come back in a month, correct? They won't come back at on on, 19, on the they 19th. They will come back on the nineteenth for the second read to the okay. For the first approval. For the first, first approval, approval, and then then it's minus that one. Yes, my okay. Thing. And then we'll come back for second approval in November. Okay. Don't we still have a kind of a hold on the one about uh, student expression and things like that? Um, there was an update, uh, 220, I think it was. Uh, po Policy 220, we put on a hold. Uh, that most recent court case, we're waiting for an update from legal on that. 
Uh, we just received a brand new policy news network we share with the committee as well with the additional slew. So we'll keep busy, but yes, 220 was held. So both of those will not be up for approval on, on the, the 19th. 19th. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So um, our next item is the meeting, the 19th regular meeting. I know we do have an executive session to discuss uh, contracts um, and then our usual actions. I mean, that would be um, staff support, um, bus drivers, uh, any other actions, personnel. personnel. Um, is there any other big items coming up? I don't think uh, so. No, 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 no. Okay. So at this point, we are moving along to the second citizen comment. Same rules apply. Mr. Kessler? Yes, I have two have come in. Kelly Murphy, we have two children in the Central York School District. Our children have been enrolled in several buildings, Stony Brook, Hayshire, North Hills Middle School, and now Central's Remote Learning Program. We would like to thank all of the teachers and administrators for their hard work and dedication for all students. We are so lucky to be surrounded by such supportive academic environment. We would like for all teachers and administration to be celebrated for all of their efforts. We encourage others to write positive letters or emails to teachers and administrators we need to fill our community with support and kindness. Thank you, Kelly Murphy. One other one <clears throat> uh, from Valerie DeMeglio. Dear CUSD board, it is the parents role in children's lives to discuss sensitive issues happening in our nation, not the diversity committee members, not administration, not parents who are siding with leftists and not the teachers. We are their parents and we are the ones who oversee their moral development. We set the standards for our children's moral compass according to family belief systems in the home. They are, they are not your property to mold. Your job is to make sure they practice the kindness, empathy, and respect parents teach at home. And if a child is not, then the school needs to step in regarding that individual. It is not acceptable to broadly preach to the entire student body. There is a huge racism problem at Central and that they all need diversity training because of what is happening in our nation. It is most definitely unacceptable to fill their heads with leftist idea, ideas about race relation. We do not have racial tensions. We do not have racial tensions district-wide at Central York. Are we saying there aren't possible individual cases? No, but it is not a pervasive problem or else we wouldn't be just addressing it now. Instead, it is only after we have the, ra the radical left in America pushing an anti-American fundamental change. What we do have is a district-wide bullying problem that is never dealt with. From personal experience, our child has had bullies that have never had any real consequences because the same children have been tormentors since we moved here five years ago. If this district truly cared about tolerance and empathy, you need to start looking in a mirror to see you do nothing about the many children at Central York who suffer years with nothing done. Will you only care to act against kids who are bully kids if it's because of color? All students of all colors are suffering bullying at Central. The focus on creating a narrative, our children need a leftist version of diversity training, yet CYSD cannot even address the pervasive bullying issue in Central, in Central speaks volumes to obvious agendas. The fact the fact the biggest issue week after week at CYSD board meetings is about diversity resources and the goal of diversity training of our children with only leftist resources being used speaks volumes to many parents. When we have leftist political groups demanding to rewrite our nation's history curriculum through their political lens, it's unacceptable. Tolerance and diversity is not created through hatred because people want to point a finger at one group for all problems. It is absurd that administration finds it more important pushing political agendas of these groups, completely ignoring many of its students who are victims of bullying in our schools. Recently, I had a discussion with a child therapist about the curriculum resources from this list, and she said that this is just short of being deemed child abuse. She explained that Central York administration and teachers who teach this are abusing their authority roles as educators to convince impressionable children one group is the cause of other groups' problems regardless of personal choices. These teachings aren't about harmony or equity, but shame, guilt, and hatred. It is obvious the committee is misguided in its mission by using one-sided political resources. It's unacceptable, it is not diverse at all. The Central York administration needs its priorities straightened out on what the important issues of our students are facing. Not only is bullying a huge issue, but according to YDR in 2019, Central York test scores are falling, failing, falling 
at high school levels. The district's top priority should be to focus on efforts on fundamentals of academics, not social justice. Maybe if you had board meetings to take up weeks on end dedicated to fixing these problems, more of our students would be excelling in readying them for their futures. It is completely misguided and unacceptable that this is what Central York School administration decides is priority, social justice. From the following numbers, it is evident that many of our students are not doing well as a group in ELA and math. Why isn't the board and administration more focused on bringing in speakers and resources concerning getting our virtual learners the best possible education? We as parents can assure you it isn't all roses in the virtual learning world. However, it's evidence that we are now on the fourth board meeting that social justice seems to be administration's focus. How many tax dollars are being spent on speakers for this and not about bullying, virtual learning, or how to boost numbers and test scores? It is taking up valuable time and energy of administrators, teachers, and board members who need to do the real work of getting our children a quality education going forward into this uncertain future, not training them for being the next generation of social justice warriors and activism. No amount of diversity training will ever change the heart and soul of a true racist. The time and efforts of educators needs to be spent on education, not left-leaning indoctrination. Dr. Snell stated during a board meeting a few weeks back that he loses sleep at night over parents having choices in education going forward. You are right, sir, we do. We do have choices and ours will not be Century York schools if this is taught. We will make sure we find a way to take our tax dollars with us and encourage many to do the same. Brandon and Valerie DeMeglio. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Kessler, for doing that. Uh, at this point, um, we are moving on to any um, possible board comments. Anyone? Okay. Just, uh, you know, personally, I've championed doing these meetings live streamed or televised or whatever the method is, and I think the public has a right to see everything, but hopefully one of these days soon, We'll be back to having people attending these meetings. And I do believe our policy needs some major adjustments because right now, I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying the public has gotten accustomed to being able to email in and then have people read these things. Are we going to allow that after we allow people to come up to the microphone and talk? Will it be both virtual and in, in presence? Or are we going to then limit it to just people that show up in person? I, I don't necessarily have an opinion, but I don't think we've adapted to that. So that needs to be addressed. I would tell you that, you know, if I were king, I would have under the board, uh, the school board tab, letters to the board. So everybody can see what's been said. There's no secrets and, and public is, is transparent. Thank you. Yeah. I just have a question about the um, Keystone Scholarship Award. Did we um, talk about what the qualifications are for that? Can we hear those? We don't really even know those quite yet. We're waiting. I think it's pretty open-ended from what Mr. Kessler has been able to research. So that's something that you'll have to decide. But something is forthcoming. And as soon as we know more, we'll be happy to share it with you. But that's sort of all we know. We saw, I think we read it in the morning, as you all did with your PSBA daily e email. And that's the first we'd heard of it. So we'll find out, make sure you know. Uh, two things. First, the first weekend in October next year, and I think I talked about this in January or February, um, we think a pretty big deal is going to go on. The 50th anniversary of the Central York Colonial Fife and Drum will occur in York as a tourism activity with a, I think the right word is muster, bringing in Fife and Drum groups from across the Eastern Seaboard. I'm part of that committee. There's alumni, there's some former employees. And this was all started as a concept of Ken Matthews, a former band director at the middle school who tragically passed away this past summer. And I think there'll be a whole lot more we'll see about that over the next several months. And the second piece is kind of along Greg's thing. And I'll just start by saying, you know, I don't need to listen to an op-ed that was sent to the York Daily Record or the York Dispatch. I can pay my dollar and get that and read it or read it online. I was sent some screenshots by some social media posts, I think, which included one of our board members. And there's three things that jumped out at me. And we all know people have been cutting and pasting their letters to the board. Not so much what we read tonight, but the ones we've been getting in the mail. 
Um, one of the things I saw in there was encouraging saying, well, you don't have to live in Central to send a letter about this, which we all know is an issue. And we heard that in the first one tonight saying, if I lived in your district. And the last piece, one that really did bother me, though, was suggesting that you send a letter and copying, blind copying seven of the nine school board members in case the letter got lost. That one bothered me that just send it to all nine of, nine of us, but not seven of nine of us. And I fully trust that the letters don't get lost, that the things that are supposed to be read are being read. Thank you. I have a question that, or a request that's totally off the subject. So I've, I've read somewhere where every year we do a safe school report to the government in July. And that outlines the disciplinary problems and issues that have occurred. Um, where are those reports and how can we get them? Um, Mr. Billet fills those out. It's a state requirement. Certain categories get reported. We'll make sure that you have access to those. We'll, we'll get them. Mm -hmm. I'll just share as a piece of information, there was 130 people that were watching um, as far as the numbers that were watching the live stream tonight. Um, there were two groups outside tonight and um, a couple of board members and I, we went out and taught and we spoke to both groups, I think in detail. Um, the one group I spoke to a bunch of students, which was nice to hear them. Um, I know we tabled the curriculum. Um, is there a way that we can bring that back for next month? And I would also recommend before we even put that back on the table, it, I mean, not next month, but I meant the next meeting, the 19th, could we have a workshop to discuss how the curriculum is written? Maybe talk to the teachers that actually did help to, to write that. So we could get some clarification before we would, you know, place a vote on that. And I will have to say, when we were speaking to one group, it was all about the resources. And that's not what we're voting on. And that resource list, which has a lot of bad ideas and some books that I would definitely not want in our district, that's getting muddied with the curriculum. And I, I how do we rest assured to the um, to the parents and and the community that those resources will not be used, you know, like in fact that book, not my idea. So, I, I think we need some clarification. It doesn't have to be tonight, but I think we need to think and talk about this resource list because I mean that's why everybody is really upset. Um, I think that um, there are quite a few board members that would welcome the socialized curriculum uh, back. And um, again, what you're saying is true that that resource list has muddied the, the waters terribly, terribly. Um, and I, you know, I would like to see our diversity committee, you know, go back and sort of start up a, a list of resources that are balanced and that we, or we make sure somebody takes responsibility to vet that list and make sure it is balanced because I certainly have reviewed and read and listened to uh, a lot of the materials there and I do not feel it's balanced and I think it's divisive. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I'm in support of, uh, I think we were talking about doing some sort of curriculum workshop, sort of just seeing how curriculum goes because we have a lot of new board members some of us that really haven't delved into it and we really nice to make sure we don't get ourselves in a pickle like this um, again. And it's sort of seeing how curriculum writers go from A to Z. Okay. So uh, to, to Ms. Gut's point many times about approving curriculum, approving uh, textbooks um, that we really don't have anymore, which means teachers have a lot of carte blanche to go and just pull resources from this, you know, never ending internet. Now I know that they, they have collaboration, they meet with their department chairs, they sit down and they review, 
Uh, they, there are still some textbooks out there that, you know, it's not a bunch of teachers just, you know, looking for a resource list to teach their classes. I don't know how many of those, you know, those th that resource list was not a list that was provided so that we could go out and start purchasing books. Um, but it, because it's caused such a problem within the community, we've got to find a way to get over this hump. And the curriculum workshop, I don't know how quickly we could facilitate that. Um, and I would defer that to, to both of you or Dr. Snell to say, can we, like I said, an A to Z, how do we get from a benchmark? Well, let's start at the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Comes down, benchmarks, classes, structure, and then how does it end up in the classroom? Uh, and I think that's more of about understanding, to Ms. Guth's point many times, it's about understanding if we are going to be responsible for curriculum as a board or proving curriculum um, and also textbooks, which don't exist anymore, it kind of just leaves a big hole in the middle for us to try and figure out. Um, I, you know, I know that our, our, our staff does a good job. I know that they're working hard, but it's more of a clarification, I think, and an understanding that we know how it works now, especially in the world of just computers mostly. Um, so I don't know what we can do to facilitate that. If, we, if we, we have an executive session next Monday, maybe we could do something before the meeting, I think sooner rather than later. I don't, I, I'd like a recommendation from you, Dr. Snell. Can I just add to this? Um, we talked about a workshop, a curriculum workshop we talked about a potential advisory group. Mm -hmm. um, we also talked about diversity committee not being involved in curriculum at all, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we need a lot of clarification on those issues before we approve anything, number one. Number two, I thought we, we came to the understanding that the history pilot wasn't necessarily due to be rewritten because it was within the five years. When was it last written? The history two years ago, but I think we had gotten an explanation of all that last time from Mr. Grove about. It wasn't necessary. It was just suddenly rewritten as of the spring, even though it didn't need to be because it was within two years ago that we wrote it and it's supposed to be updated every five years is, was what I thought. <laughs> Uh, um, <clears throat> the the five-year curriculum revision cycle has been altered any number of times over the years. At the beginning of last school year, we said that we were going to write 7 through 12. Mr. Grove's decision and the teachers was to bring K-6 along so that we could write them all in concert. So, you know, whether it's a keystone, whether we go back to the common core, or any number of reasons that things have changed, we have altered the five-year curriculum revision. That's a that's a sort of an administrative regulation, if you will. It's a It's an approach. It's not a hard and fast rule as to what we will write each and every year, that, that can change. Yeah, I think this is an example of how our policy is out of date. The original policy said the board approved the curriculum, a board approved the textbooks, and the board approved reading lists on some kind of a basis. The world has changed and the policy has not. And so I think we need to revisit the policy as to what the board involvement in curriculum and resources are and clarify that. And so I personally am looking at policies that need revision to be brought into the 21st century and reflects the reality. Because if the concept was curriculum extended to textbooks and to reading lists, then there is a big gap when you do the curriculum, but you aren't involved with the, the resources or the textbooks or whatever. So I think we really need to revisit that policy and bring it up to date so that whatever it is the board's authority is, is reflected appropriately in the policy that we're living with because there's a big disjoint between what the board does and what happens in the classroom since everything in between has changed. So just because we don't have textbooks anymore, there still are instructional materials that take the place, whether it be websites, the book list that came from the diversity committee, 
those still need to be vetted and approved by this board. According to the policy, we need to review it and we need to update it. So for that history pilot to come back for a vote, we would need to have that policy updated, correct, before that? Because we would have to approve the instructional materials on how we're teaching that history pilot and library and guidance. Uh, I don't necessarily believe the policy. I mean, we look at how long policies take. And I mean, I don't know that, I'm not saying we don't need to look at the policy, that's fine. Um, I, I think that at any point in time, if anybody on this board chose to bring that curriculum back and untable it, it can happen. It doesn't have to be because the, the policy doesn't have to change for, I mean, I'm just talking about process. But so that does not have to happen. And I think, you know, it, it's more about trying to find a way to separate ourselves from, the, so the from that diversity list. Mm -hmm. I get it. So how do we give the community a guarantee and a reassurance that those resources will not be used to teach this pilot? That, that's what I've been saying for weeks because people have been saying this list means nothing, but it doesn't mean nothing because it was produced by the diversity committee for curriculum. Okay, so let me, let me just counter that. Um, the diversity committee approved it after the curriculum was written and done. They're two separate things. Um, I, am, I have the list. I am now the owner of the diversity list, the book list. It's in, it's in my purview. I have it and I will vet it. I will review it. I will do nothing with it initially. Um, but that is not curriculum. One of the things I think that's gotten Sally down the lane a little bit is a, what we call a curriculum pilot. In our five-year cycle, the first time we bring curriculum to the board, it's called a curriculum pilot. The second time we allow you to approve it, it's called an adoption. We come at you twice with this so that you have ample time over two years. So there's nothing that we're piloting secretively. When we come to you for the first time, if you go back to the August agenda, it says curriculum pilots, which is the first year you approve it. And it says curriculum adoptions, which is the second year. I will no longer use the word pilot because it's been confused. It's a curriculum adoption number one, and it's a curriculum adoption number two. This whole pilot thing got hitched to the unfortunate list that was created five days after we wrote curriculum. So I still consider they're two separate things. I understand the confusion. I owned it a couple meetings ago. Um, we shouldn't have called it a curriculum piece. They're two separate things. We come to you for a first approval and we come to you for a second approval like we always had. If we want to talk about what the policy is or have a conversation around how we might do it in the future, we're happy to do that. We have never said we wouldn't. Um, ultimately, some of the relief that you might seek comes from policy. Um, the others might come from a, look, a hard look at a workshop around what is the five year. But it's a curriculum pilot, which is the first time we bring it to you. And then it's a curriculum adoption, which is the second time that we bring it to you. So there are two times you get to look at this. It, nothing is secretive here. Um, it's all out there. They're based on state standards, as we have said. Okay. I have a note down here. One of teachers. Oh, sorry. I have a printout of one of the teachers. And I'm just being transparent here. I'm not trying to start trouble. And I would also like to make one other point that this has never been about diversity. We are a diverse district. We are a diverse country, correct? We love diversity. We celebrate it. We welcome it. I think Central does a great job. This has never been about diversity or whether we're accepting diversity or not. We accept it. We love it. So when that accusation comes out that we don't want diversity, it is it is very, it's a, it's a huge misunderstanding. Talk about the diversity list compared to curriculum. Well, that's another misunderstanding that this has brought to the table. Because again, I'm not gonna, re I'll repeat myself one more time. We have diversity, we love it, we enjoy it, we celebrate it, we want it. But we, we're not rejecting that. We're rejecting the one-sided pieces of it, of not even diversity, of, the, of those resources. It was one-sided teaching. So I have a printout of what one of the teachers printed out of her equity resources and what she was gonna be social justice standards, teaching tolerance, diversity history, race, racial justice, Skyping in the classroom. All of this is from that curriculum meeting that was being put forth 
in addition to that diversity resource. So if we're gonna bring back the pilot to, to approve, that's fine, but the, we need to be transparent and have full disclosure of what instructional materials are being used to teach those pilots after this debacle, okay? And the craziness that has come out of it and the division that has come to this board over it. So if you want, the other concern I have, if you wanna talk about screenshots, I've seen plenty of screenshots of teachers on social media saying they're gonna smile through the hall that hallway close the door and teach what they want. So again, we need full disclosure. We need transparency. Parents are in charge of their students. We want parents and taxpayers to be engaged with this board. That's one of the things that we were talking about when we were talking about the change of the school day. We want the community engaged with this board. Now we're saying we want to reject letters coming in. I, I can't follow it now. Everybody wants this one day and, and something another. Let's guarantee these resources are not gonna be used. Bring the pilot back for approval, fine. Let communities, people write in because we want the community to be engaged. That's their right and that's what we want. And again, this is not about diversity. The word diversity has been overused and abused through this whole process. I, I think that the problem, um, that has been the biggest issue is that resource list. And, you know, you talked about getting over the hump. The hump was that list was never ready to be shared. It was never vetted. It, it's a combination of... Actually, it was vetted. It was a vetted yeah. by the diversity committee. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about the administration. I'm not talking... Of the diversity committee is comprised of not only just teachers, it's comprised of... It's comprised of um, community um, board members and teachers. I mean, yeah, I'm, there's more teachers on it than ever, but, but what I'm saying is the list was not ready. It shouldn't have been shared before it got vetted. And it was, you know, their job to vet it. So that's what the problem is. And it's getting confused with our curriculum that we're supposed to approve. The thing is, they thought it was vetted. Mr. Grove, you saw the list. They were discussing it openly in, at, at the, in those committee meetings. And they, every single meeting minute, that diversity list was attached from July all through August. It that, was that's because a number of folks asked for it. And in, a, in an effort of transparency, we continued to send it out. Um, well, it was and it was never from, vetted. There, there, there's no vetting of this by the, the committee. The, all we did throughout the summer was gather the list of resources and put it on a list. It was shared from the minute it was developed. And it wasn't requested to be shared publicly until after the August 10th meeting. But it was shared as meeting minutes every single week. Yeah, when we started the diversity committee over the summer, as we mentioned, I don't think I'll contradict myself anywhere, um, was at the request of teachers. And right or wrong, whether we feel they needed that uh, reassurance when it comes to verbiage or uh, dialogue, uh, support, whatever, whatever it is, whether we think they did or they didn't, they expressed to us they needed that. They felt compelled to get together. They wanted us to act in a proactive way. Um, in doing that, we put people together. We got together. We broke the normalcy of our traditional um, diversity committee that happens during the school year that doesn't impact curriculum, just like we said before, doesn't impact the curriculum, celebrates who we are and what we do. But we broke that traditional approach to the diversity committee by going virtual and doing it in the summer. So that act in itself clearly shows that there was a prompting of us to do that. And it was at the request of our teachers, which we listen to our teachers. If they need professional development, they need support, we want to do the best that we can. So then we evolved into those meetings, virtual meetings. And um, what happened was people would bring up topics 
and they say, well, are you capturing these? Where are we putting these things so that we could grow? So if somebody puts this book out here, this resource over here, I, at my convenience, if I chose to, I could go look at it. That was my interpretation, my understanding of that resource list, which I completely agree with everybody, is at the root of people's consternation. They're having, uh, and what was put in there was put on by the committee. And I'm not condemning anybody because the bottom line is they landed in there. Lopsided it may be. And I'm not here to, I'm not going to contradict anybody. But so are that you saying was, you disagree with that list? I'm saying that that list was created by the committee for the committee. There was no long-term vision for that to take place. And, and what I asked the board is just to consider, why did we break all those years of diversity committee for that, that period of time? It was to help our teachers, nothing more, nothing less. And the last thing I want to do is have community members um, not feeling comfortable with one another over topics, over this or that. We try to be as transparent as possible. Everybody had a right to put something in there. And they did. Right or wrong, they did. That committee was not to go on forever. I'd like to revert back to the committees that we've had before, like we talked about the other mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. And there are three or four topics that we could go back to, celebrating who we are, mm -hmm. providing resources for families, those type of things. That's what the committee was before. And I would like to get back to that, but that's not, at my, that's not for me to decide that. So um, that's what I wanted to make sure that I could at least clarify. The list was created by the committee members for the committee members. And I wasn't really in charge of saying yay or nay to it. It was, it was a dumping ground. It was a place to store. It was a repository, right or wrong. So that, that's, that's what I have, and that's what I know to be the case at this point in time. And I agree with Ms. Ms. Grothy. It is, it is at the crux of a, a curriculum that is standards-based versus the resources. And uh, I agree with you. The textbooks aren't – we don't have the textbooks to the greatest degree like we used to, to your point. Resources are greater. Technology plays a role in it. Uh, what our kids are asked to do tomorrow and five years down the road, these are all – going to impact our kids. And you're right. Our parents are the main drivers of who their children are and where they expect their children to be. Our job is to be responsive to our parents as well. So I don't know if that helps, but that's as fourth rate as I can be. Yeah. I, I think I'm just going to say one sentence. That list was a brainstorming idea. That was for, that was a whiteboard whenever you're trying to grab ideas and people throwing stuff on it. And that's what it was. And before it went out to be shared with the public, it should have been reviewed. But it was what it is, is what it was. Can I have one comment? Yeah, please. If we should take anything away from it, it's like Ms. Guth was saying for everybody, because I talked to Dr. Snell briefly the other day about it, and he's saying he basically had the frustration of saying that anything that comes out, the teachers pick up off the internet, this set of the teacher classes, their resources, they go in to find different things for the resources to be able to teach the class the way they see it. So the real question is, are we just gonna allow teachers to teach the classes the way they see it? Or do we wanna be as the constituents want them to be on, which is more back to, we don't have books, we don't have ways that we need to be drilled down and as you were saying the other day, from the beginning to the end, or what are we looking at on, when we talk about our certain course? What do we want to have taught? Not generalistic, but more like a no kidding syllabus that we are going to use these materials to teach this course and give them choices on how they, they can delve more into, you know, the, the Eastern Front versus the Pacific in World War II. But we need to be able to have something that we're going to be using or if they want to talk about the Skiggy Airmen, but we need to have something that we're saying, these are the approved things that we want taught because we don't have books anymore. That's the takeaway. I, everybody here believes in diversity and believes in equity and equality. We all do. This thing pointed out that we are so far behind. We're, we're still back, talk about brick and mortar, we're still back on scrolls and papyrus compared to where the rest of the world is and where we're teaching. So we need to change how we put these topics forward. And, and that's what we really need. When you talk about curriculum, that's what happens because when you said exactly what you said was the fact that we had this whole thing drawn up, but then we had resources come in after. And my point, our point, everybody else's point has been, well, when you go to teach those things, where do you look for the resources? Well, they just came out with this list. Okay, let's look at that list. 
that's the natural tendency because we've said that it came from the school or the committee or somebody talked about it was what's being talked about. That's why we're here. So let's move forward and, and, make, and make a difference on how we do our classes. That's what I would recommend. Thank you. Jane, I just got to chime in quickly and I appreciate the discussion. Okay, I think this is a good, healthy discussion we're having. I wish it would have been on the agenda because of the 151 people. We don't know how many clicked off at board comment and missed this discussion. And this is discussion I think we've been trying to have. Um, and I'll just add, if we go to a workshop thing, we have to be careful that there's distance between a workshop and a vote. So that's, that's out there. So this thing keeps getting pushed down if we keep talking about a workshop. Um, I did have a conversation with our solicitor regarding that. And that, as long as we're not deliberating, we could have a workshop discussion. It wouldn't, but if it's a particular to just this topic, then it's going to, could be a problem. So we'll, I'll get, I'll get back to you guys on that and we'll try and get that moved along as quickly as possible because it certainly seems to be something that we need to move forward on. A question I have for Mr. Grove or Dr. Snell did the diversity committee always have a professional development part to it? Um, no, no. Because I would that's, say that's where this transition took place. The diversity committee came up with this list. We know not who put the things on there. And then the diversity committee started interacting with how do we teach this in professional development to the teachers the teachers asked for help with how do we deal with this subject, and the diversity committee came up with resources and professional development to help them know how to deal with the subject, and some of us took exception to what they were promoting to the teachers because that was going to become if that's how they were professionally developed and that's how they were given resources, that's how they would be, they would think they were instructed to present the situation to their classrooms. And so it seems to me that the real problem was the diversity committee took on a life of its own and got involved in things that they never had any reason to be involved in. And so, you know, we need to redefine what is the diversity committee and what, are, what is their mandate because they got into curriculum, they got into professional development and all of these things that are integral to implementing a, the curriculum in the classroom. And that's, that's where the problem came in. Not so much the pilot items, but how are they going to be interpreted when the teachers look at these fairly generic benchmarks, and then we say, well, here's some professional development to help you know how to interpret them. And those development, professional development training sessions were based on the resources. And so I can understand you're saying they're separate, but they're really not because the tentacles of the diversity committee reached into the classroom through the curriculum and through the professional development, which the committee never had any reason to be the part of. The main goal of the professional development that I took away was that they looked at a possible speaker that would be able to share uh, multiple vantage points and uh, to have people hear, much as what I heard the other evening, different perspectives. And then um, ultimately people are gonna walk away uh, with their own decisions and uh, hopefully teach in a way that is reflective of our community. So that's when we say professional development, I was taking away the recommendation of a speaker. Just for a little bit of a correction, this will predate Dr. Snell or Mr. Grove. Jody may remember and probably Ryan remembers, actually the diversity committee started with professional development. And we did a three, I think a three year sessions, two of those hosted by Dr. Terrell Jones, the vice provost of diversity education at Penn State which goes back for the very beginning of this. So it actually started with professional development that every employee of Central York down to bus drivers who weren't our employees at the time went through that educational piece. And then it changed over the years, more of a celebration type of program. And it got, because of 
developments in our country in the past six months, it changed again. But really, what it's, that's what it started as. And we did a really good job for a number of years with all of our staff on that topic. Thank you. Okay. Um, Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Before we go, there's nothing else to be adjourned. I mean, okay.